County. We have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Yorana Lopez. Tenemos traducción en español. Si necesita de este sobreso, por favor, pase con Yorana Lopez. Um, so if someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, you must complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria. Prior to the agenda item, each speaker will have two minutes um, for that agenda item, and Trustee Flores will be reading out those cards this evening. Wow, so this is a big meeting for the 1st of June. Um, I see a lot of new faces here tonight, so I want to take a moment to establish some sort of ground rules for the board um, and these meetings. Um, there may be differences of opinion. Some strong, sometimes there are strong differences. Uh, please give those uh, speaking the same respect that you would like to receive when you are speaking. This will allow everyone to be heard and the board to conduct its necessary business. So um, next, we're going to move to item 3.2. And um, in honor of Flag Day, and I think it's the 248th anniversary of the um, Army, I am going to actually ask Trustee Soto, one of our uh, very own veterans, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Perfect. Okay, and then now we will move to item 3.3, our superintendent comments. So Dr. Rodriguez, our superintendent, will make a few comments. Yeah, thank you. So this week we started our biggest ever um, summer school program. So thank you to Jim Bruno, to Nancy Zuniga and their work. So we have over 6,000 students that are participating in up to a nine hour program. So um, I really appreciate their work and um, the, all the good things that are happening. Also today, I was able to meet with our summer in the city. So as you had heard, um, we doubled the number of students who are in an intern with the city and with the school district. And so they were a really great group. They were looking towards um, doing the strengths finder to really figure out what their skills were, what their assets are, and how they can work with others. So if you do, if you still have a child that needs those services, um, especially the summer school, um, please reach out to us and um, we will try to accommodate you. And um, I'll have further comments on um, 6.1. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, now we will be moving to item 3.4, governing board comments, reports on standing committee meetings. This is the opportunity for each member to make a few comments. And we will start with our very own trustee, DeSerpa. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, this was the graduation season, and we had a wonderful, wonderful graduation. I attended all three comprehensive high schools, new school, adult school graduations. Um, it was just very, very special, and it makes us feel um, very connected to our student community when we get to see all the happy faces of the students and the families. I want to congratulate Morielle Mamarel, who was our student trustee. She is off as of today to Cornell University. Um, where she'll be going to school and doing a summer um, prep there. So we're super, super proud of her. Um, in the last, um, I, I didn't say this last time, but I also attended a DLAC meeting as well as the Down to Earth Women's Luncheon um, to support agriculture, and that was really special. So anyway, thanks for everybody for being here tonight. Sorry, Trustee Soto. Yeah, good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending tonight's meeting and those of you viewing as well. Um, I'll yield my comments for this evening and just want to once again congratulate all the graduates out there. Thank you. Sorry, Trustee Bellano Scow. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. We have a very exciting, uh, action packed agenda as always. I also want to reiterate, Trustee. The Serpo, we had some amazing graduations. Thank you to all the staff, all the teachers, all the classified workers, 
who made those so successful and safe. There's a lot of work that goes into those. So thank you to all of our staff who made those happen. They're beautiful, beautiful days. I'll keep it moving. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee George Jr. I just want to say good evening, everybody. Um, just to keep it brief, uh, I was able to attend Watsonville High School PV and E Hall's graduation. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you to the people who I represent, and I continue to look forward to serving you. Thank you. Trustee Flores. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for spending your night with us tonight. Um, I was able to attend Watsonville High School's Renaissance and PV High's graduations, and they were great. Um, first time being able to attend in this role, it was really nice to be able to shake my niece's hand as she crossed the stage. Um, and I want to say thank you to all everyone who took part in making those graduations so wonderful for our students. Thank you. Uh, President, uh, Trustee Dr. Holm. Like my, my colleagues, I attended, you know, multiple graduations from adult education to our three comprehensive high schools and uh, Renaissance High. And it was, I wish I could clone myself because it, it's, it's one of the most special moments, you know, of our year. Um, but I, I was ecstatic to be able to uh, congratulate so many students directly. And I'll, I will wait for the comments for now. Um, I, I am going to waive my comments considering, um, sorry for the delayed start to this evening's meeting. We have a lot of items going on um, this evening in closed session and the board will actually have to reconvene to closed session this evening. So um, I'm going to waive my comments, but I cannot let to, um, my opportunity to comment tonight to say a very happy Father's Day to all of the fathers in our community from our employees to the fathers of our students. We have fathers who are school board trustees as well. We have um, women on the board who are married to men who are also fathers. So I just want to extend a very, very happy Father's Day to everyone and I hope everybody has a wonderful, happy Father's Day. And with that, we will move to um, uh, approve the agenda. So I am going to make a motion to approve the agenda with removing item 10.8. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Perfect. And that carries 7-0. Thank you. I am also going to now move to item 5.1. Can I have a motion to approve um, the board meeting minutes from our May 24th, 2023 board meeting? I make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Perfect, thank you. And now we will move to um, action item 6.1 um, to accept the um, resignation of our superintendent, D Dr. Um, Michelle Rodriguez. And this item will be presented by President Trustee Dr. Holm. Thank you, everyone. Um, so Dr. Rodriguez has been our superintendent for nearly in that time, our district uh, was inducted into the League of Innovative Schools, given accolades for the quick response to the COVID-19 pandemic, has increased the growth of our students on map indicators, made great strides in urban literacy, and vastly expanded arts and garden programs. This is just a small sample of the gains our district has made under uh, her leadership. As most people already know, our superintendent submitted her letter of resignation dated uh, June 7, 2023. Her last day of service to PVUSD will be June 30th um, of this year, as she transitioned to her superintendency at Stockton Unified School District as of July 1st. I look forward to hearing um, of further successes from her new district. I want to note that later in this meeting, we will vote on adding a discussion item to the June 17th uh, special board study session regarding the interim and permanent superintendent process to ensure transparency of that process. But for now, uh, this action item is to give the board an opportunity to formally accept Dr. Rodriguez's resignation. So, if there's any questions or comments. Thank you, President Trustee Dr. Holm. Um, and so, reiterating um, her end comment there, do we have any sp public speakers to this item? This would be action item 6.1. We do not. Okay, seeing none. 
Do we have any discussion from the board? I was going to say, I think Trustee DeSerpa should, since she is the one sitting up here who is the only one that's on the board still that hired the superintendent. <coughs> Um, I had the pleasure of um, writing a letter to the board members in Stockton um, recently. When I um, heard the news about Michelle, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, leaving our district, I was um, all at once overcome with um, a great deal of sadness, but also um, very, very happy for her personally. Um, she's done an amazing job here and um, I will miss her greatly. Um, so thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for everything that you've done on behalf of the children in this district and our staff and teachers. Um, I'm just gonna read a little excerpt of um, the letter that I sent. I said, here at Pajaro Valley Unified School District in Santa Cruz County, we hired Dr. Rodriguez seven years ago. She impressed me greatly by being the only candidate, and this was vetted by a prestigious law firm, search firm, sorry, a prestigious search firm who had prepared for our interview by deeply examining and being able to speak to our data. She had done an analysis and brought ideas and plans for how to move our district's achievement forward so that our students were better prepared for college and career. At the time, and I'm, this is just a sidebar, at the time our district was at the very bottom of the rankings in the state of California for achievement. Um, So she had done an analysis, brought ideas and plans for how to move our district's achievement forward so that our students were better prepared for college and career. At that time, Dr. Rodriguez was an assistant superintendent in Santa Ana, and I wondered if she would be able to make the transition to handle a superintendent role. She not only met my expectations, she far exceeded them. I'm so proud of the work that she produced while during her tenure here. She has an excellent understanding of curriculum and education. She makes it a point to visit two or more campuses daily. In this way, she speaks to staff, teachers, and administrators alike, listening to their perspective and making adjustments as needed. We are really gonna miss you here. We thank you for your service. I know at times it wasn't easy, and we're just so grateful that we had you for the time that we did, and we wish you, or I wish you personally, all the best in your new position. I, you're gonna do great things there. They're very, very fortunate to have you, Michelle. Well, Trustee Dodge, Jr. I'd just like to say thank you, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, for giving the seven years that you gave to our district, and. Stockton Unified, you have a fighter as is your superintendent. And so, good luck, Dr. Michelle Reeves. Thank you. Trustee Bellano Scow. Also, want to thank Dr. Rodriguez for all of her work here in seven years. Um, in particular, uh, as an artist, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful to your work championing the arts here. Uh, something I want to continue to build on here in this district. So, thank you for doing that. I know that was really, you spearheaded that. And it's really done great things for our kids. So I just want to thank you and, and great luck in Stockton. Trustee Soto. Yeah, I too want to extend the uh, best of luck to Dr. Rodriguez and her endeavors in the future. When I started in this district, I was under a different superintendent. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez came in and you could see the wave of change happen, you know, as soon as she stepped in the into that position here at the district. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with you, to get to know you and uh, on two different levels, you know, as a subordinate and then also as a colleague. And um, yeah, so good luck and give them hell out there. And, and uh, I know that it's gonna be a significantly larger district, but I think with what you've learned here, you're gonna take that with you and apply it over there. So good luck. Trustee Flores. I also just want to say congratulations on your new position and I look forward to seeing you know what you can do over there and wish you the best of luck. President, Trustee Dr. Holm, did you have any additional comments you wanted to make? I do. Uh, the mark of a, a powerful and strong leader is that they 
that the, we talk about, you know, somebody captaining the ship. But Dr. Rodriguez, one of the things that you have done is, you know, set things up so that you will be missed. Yes. But our district is strong. And you leave it in a good place. And that, to me, is one of the highest marks of a leader. That the leader, that the, the ship isn't dependent on one particular individual. So, and like Trustee DeSerpa said, it's like, I have this mixed emotion where I really enjoyed working with you. And, you know, I will happily accept the resignation because it's an amazing opportunity and it's an opportunity for us. And what you've done is remarkable. And I don't want that glossed over in or think in that then in the acceptance of that. And um, so I'm going to kind of just echo a few comments, I, um, both with what uh, President Trustee Dr. Holmes said and with what Trustee Soto said. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity for you, and I know you are very excited about it and you're beaming. Um, it's pretty much a little bit over, actually, twice the size of our district. So it's a wonderful career opportunity and very good lateral movement for you, and I'm, I'm happy for you and your career for that. Um, I wish you all the best in that. Um, similar to Trustee Soto, having been a former employee of this district, um, not under you as my administrator, um, head administrator, but I've seen a lot of turnover with administrators within this district. So um, I, you know, am looking forward to what's next as well for our district and our community. And um, I wish you again all the best in your career. And with that, um, I have to ask. Um, for a motion to approve the um, action item 6.1, the acceptance of the resignation of the superintendent, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. I have a um, first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Perfect. And there we go. Best of luck to you. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. We should have offered that. I'm so yeah, sorry. So, so I just want to say to the community um, how much Pajaro Valley means to me and will continue to mean to me. I think when I think of all the emails that I received, the one that means the most, the ones that mean the most are from our parents. And so I just want to say thank you so much for everything. Um, so. Puede decirlo en español. So, de todos los correos electrónicos que recibí, el más importante para mí era de los padres. Porque yo sé que cambié las vidas de sus hijos. So, thank you. Okay, now we are moving on to um, item 7.1. Uh, we have a public hearing on draft 2023-2024 local control accountability plan. This report will be presented by Lisa Aguirre, Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. And with that, I will open the public hearing for this item. Thank you, good evening. President Home, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. This is the uh, public hearing for the Local Control Accountability Plan. The Local Control Accountability Plan, also known as the LCAP, is a three-year plan that is updated annually. We are in year three of the three years for this plan. Okay, so the plan encapsulates the eight state priorities, um, which are the areas that are used um, to determine whether a quality educational program is being met at um, LEAs. These are the eight state priorities that the LCAP must um, sh make sure that it does address. And um, how it works is that the, the 
local control formula funding, the funding for the formula, is that we receive funding from the state. And this money that we receive, the LCAP is the plan on how we spend the funding source. So the um, first um, funding that we receive is called a base grant. This is the monies that we receive for the basic um, necessities to run a school district, which would be teacher salaries, would be fa facilities and instructional materials. On top of that, we receive supplemental grants. So we receive funding um, based on our unduplicated person, um, pupil count, which these are students of English learners, foster youth, and um, economically disadvantaged. For LEAs that have unduplicated um, percentage over um, the 55%, we receive additional funds so that we can improve or increase services for our unduplicated students. So then the monies that we receive, we, the LCAP plan is a plan on how we spend the funding monies. So um, it is a tool for, um, the LCAP is a tool for local educational agencies to set goals, have um, action plans, and leverage resources to meet those goals to improve student outcomes. We currently have, for this past year, eight goals. So last year we added the eighth goal. Um, on this slide, what you'll see is our eight goals. And on the right-hand side are the, um, the state priorities. And so um, the first LCAP goal is making sure that ensuring that all students are college, career, and life ready upon graduation from our district. And then on the right-hand side, it has number one, which those are the, the pri state priority that it matches with. Our second goal is ensuring that CT classes al are aligned to high skill, high demand, and high wage um, industry. Uh, the third goal is to increase visual and performing arts um, in our schools. Our fourth goal is the basic educational needs, which um, encapsulates the uh, facilities, teachers, and instructional materials. Fifth goal is support for our English learners. Our sixth goal is safe, supportive, positive school environment. Our seventh goal is in, um, around family engagement. And then the eighth goal is supports for students with disability. Each year, um, it is required that the local education agencies um, engage with community stakeholders to get receive feedback on the goals and the actions that are set in place and to see if we need to alter or make any little changes for the upcoming year. This year we did feedback through a Google form as well as have in-person and online meetings. We received feedback from over 1,300 staff, students, and family and community members. This is an increase of over 400 from last year. We roughly had about 500 parent or guardian, 400 staff, 366 students, I wanted to calculate that one exactly, and then uh, roughly 50 community members over the course of the time that we um, received feedback. So within the Google form, um, we wanted to look at each goal and get feedback as to whether that it was believed that the goal and the actions that were set within the goal is really aligning our resources to meet the needs of our um, most vulnerable students and our unduplicated um, students. So a question was asked, um, is I see equity commitment in LCAP goal number one. And so with this goal, um, and we had an English um, survey, and then we had also a survey for our Spanish speaking community. The numbers that I'm gonna give you is the, the combination of the both surveys put together. So 63% of the respondents um, agreed or strongly agreed that this was the case. This was the highest amount. And then 15% disagreed or strongly disagreed. So there was a portion that also was neutral. For goal number two, which is the CTE, 54% of our respondents agreed or strongly agreed, while 12% disagreed or strongly disagreed. Uh, this one had the largest amount of neutral, which means um, it could have been a lot of elementary parents who didn't have experiences with um, career technical education. For goal th um, three, which is our visual and performing arts, 60% of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed and 17% disagreed or strongly disagreed. In goal four, this is our basic um, necessities, which is facilities, 
uh, teacher salaries and instructional materials, um, staff salaries as well. 49% agreed or strongly agreed and 23% disagreed or strongly disagreed. Goal five, this is our supports for our English learners. 58% agreed or strongly agreed, while 10% disagreed or strongly disagreed. This goal had our lowest number of respondents that disagreed or strongly disagreed. My fingers are not working with my mind. Okay. Um, and so this was um, one that we had uh, the least amount of disagreed or strongly disagreed. For goal six, 60% 60 of respondents agreed or strongly agreed. Goal six is our safe climate um, on our school sites. Goal seven is parent engagement. 61% uh, agreed or strongly agreed with 12% uh, um, disagreed or strongly disagreed. And goal eight is supports for our students with disabilities. 59% of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed with 11% uh, disagreed or strongly disagreed. We're gonna look now more closely at exactly what people had said um, in the surveys. So when we, um, I broke it down with the different uh, students um, based on their level. And for elementary, um, we had a lot, we had open-ended responses that students could respond to and it was written in a way that students could understand. Um, there was a, we got, received a lot of feedback. Um, elementary would like to be more challenged in class and they, a few of them mentioned especially in math, and they appreciate their teachers. Um, secondary students, um, they like classrooms that are focused and free from distraction. Um, they also talked about the, how they learn best, which is through um, seeing the, student, the teachers do examples and hands-on. Middle school students, we saw a lot of the respondents, the respondents talk about um, how they enjoy being social with their friends and there was a huge social aspect of having more time to connect with their peers inside the classroom. Um, this graph asks students, uh, it says, I would, so students had to respond with, I need more opportunities to connect with my teachers. And so the students had the opportunity to agree, strongly agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. Um, of the students, only 11% of students disagreed with the statement, right? Which means even though you see a lot of um, strongly agree or agree, that a lot, there was a lot of neutral where they weren't saying it. Then we asked, how would you like to see it? And the number one way was during class. So students during class time want more opportunities to connect with their teachers, they're saying. Um, and Moving on with engaging educational partners, um, staff. Staff would like um, adequate staffing so that all classrooms have a, a teacher. Focus on campus safety, um, increased student engagement, staff development, more structured ELD supports, a balanced approach to PBIS, um, and then addressing staff social emotional needs. Families. The key messages that came out of the families opened in the responses, more class offerings, safety in school, teachers' commitment to student success with the need for higher academic standards, effective communication from school sites, scaffolded um, lessons for English learners, and increased intention from school staff to help students perform well. And then community members, we had uh, to keep visual arts and gardening in school, expand capacity of students to earn scholarships, and increase class offerings for all students. And so we spent time looking over all of the feedback that we received, and then we went through all of the, um, the LCAP actions items. We looked at what was budgeted, what was spent, and then through the process, um, we looked at what proposed changes that we would make for next year in the um, LCAP for year three. And this is the final year. After next year, the um, local control accountability plan is completely rewritten um, to look at having a committee together to figure out what goals, if we wanna keep the goals, how we wanna change them, and what action items would um, go with that based on the funding that we receive from the state. So in looking at the proposed changes based off of the feedback, 
um, a new goal, number one, we have to, we're adding a new goal, number nine, that focuses on uh, foster youth. This is something that we need to do based on the performance of foster youth from last year. So as we had to add students with disability, we're also adding the foster youth goal. Professional development, so we're looking at, based on the feedback that we receive from staff, staff will have opportunities to focus on their social emotional health at the beginning of the year. Professional development will be more aligned where staff is in one strand of professional development for the entire year. This is also based off of research on effective professional development and how it works. Uh, build out of entrepreneurship music at New School um, through CTE. Also in CTE, build out of engineering technology pathway at Aptos High School. Um, increase budget to the elementary visual and performing arts, or the visual um, supplies. Um, in addition, so adding an administrator academy so that we have the opportunity for administrators to really focus on the school climates to address the, um, the school climate with the positive um, support. And then focus on a tier two and tier three strategies for supporting students. Over the last two years, we've really done a focus on tier one strategies with the PBIS. And so now with some of the behaviors that we're seeing, we're addressing it, we're increasing for tier two and tier three. And then adding um, a mental health clinicians to oversee the, um, the students that are referred to the district office for tier three so that they have a caseload. So it's not so much falls on the school sites. Um, and then increasing middle and high school sports budget. There has been an increase in the cost for referees, also for to be part of the league, um, et cetera, so, in, so that the, the cost does not fall on the school where then they are taking monies from elsewhere. We're increasing the middle school and high school budget. And then students with disability, a middle, um, to focus on middle school literacy and elementary inclusion, making sure how do we get more of our students with disabilities into mainstream so they have more opportunities. The last item is the family engagement plan. This is something that had been previously on um, within the LCAP, but we didn't see much movement this year, so we're bringing it back to the forefront to ensure that 100% of our schools have a family engagement plan on how schools are really partners with our um, families. So these are our proposed changes that, would be, uh, that will be brought forward um, for approval on the June 28th meeting. The process is this evening is a public hearing to listen to the proposed changes, the feedback that we received. Um, currently, the English um, LCAP proposed draft is online with um, a survey that people can give feedback. The um, Spanish is currently being translated. It should be done by early next week. That will be placed also up there side by side with the English LCAP. So, and the survey is already in English and Spanish so that we can receive feedback. So based on that feedback that we receive, we will um, look at if we need to make, bring anything else forward on, and then the final for the final draft, the board approval on June 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any public speakers? We do not. Okay, seeing none. Any discussion from the board? Hi, so I noticed that there's a new goal around foster kids, and since the very beginning of the LCAP, because I was on, in my seat before there was an LCAP mandate, um, there, we, there was always a mandate to serve foster kids. So can you explain what's changed or? Yes, so in our, um, it was in goal one and also in goal six, we had action items that specifically address foster youth. When, um, over the course of the year, when you have certain subgroups that do not perform well, and the, um, then you specifically have to add a goal highlighting and addressing that subgroup. So this past year, um, in 21-22, they're looking at that to, for us to then add it for next year. Um, our foster youth, it was attendance, and it was um, graduation rate, which then led us to have to add the, um, the additional goal for foster youth to specifically highlight that instead of having it embedded in other goals. So what exa how exactly will we operationalize those supports for that particular subgroup? So it's calling out more specifically that we, that the highlighting the case management of our foster youth 
Um, in addition, it is highlighting um, the data specifically for foster youth. So it's having the opportunity for us to look specifically instead of it kind of being embedded in it and not necessarily highlighting it. Additionally, we are adding um, funds for the foster youth to make sure that the services that they receive on the school site are supports where they can um, support them. So specifically for attendance, there will be somebody that will be looking at the attendance, reaching out and connecting with the foster youth to find out why, if they're not coming to school, why they're not coming to school, and then having um, case management to follow up with them. Any other comments or questions from the board? So, Mr. do we still have uh, President Trustee Dr. Holm with us? No, she's not, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I have one. On the slide you had about the Administrator Academy. Yes. About some of the, pro, pro, right, the proposed changes. What, what exactly does that look like? I mean, are we talking about having to hire a new administrator to have oversight? Or are we talking about this being something put additional on our current administrators? What it's does something, that look like? Thank you. It's something additional for our current administrators. So um, we just finished two days of intense looking at their school data, of looking at um, ways of building a culture. And then before school starts, we're going to have a new administrator academy. Yeah, it's professional development for it. We're going to have a new administrator academy. So new administrators, year one and two, have to attend for four days. And then we're having two more days of our current administration to get the plan, to have set and plan um, in place the plans to ensure that we're looking at the climate based on the data to look at where supports are needed and where opportunities were missed last year. Um, so would that be just principals and ACs? Yes, would and APs, yeah, principals, APs, and ACs. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Can I just make a quick comment about that? This is something that um, we had wanted for many years because we would have new administrators coming into the district who would have all different ideas about, like, for example, suspensions. And people, some administrators would suspend a lot, some not very much. And so by having sort of this professional development, it helps, I think, everybody learn um, culture of our district and give them some gui like guardrails for how to perform their job because I think it's hard when people are elevated into that position and haven't really had um, training to do that job so um, and I it think makes it's really important pr yeah. practices best Thank practices yeah. across the district so it would sound like the assistant superintendents would be involved with assistant. that and uh, would it also be Dr. Alcantar's office as well? Would he be involved with that? Yes. Yeah, so, I that? mean, Lisa and Casey can speak to it, but they had almost every director involved yeah. in some way within those days span. Okay. Um, but definitely with school climate, it would be a culmination of, um, of all three. So Dr. Ekevas and then also um, Casey McLean, I'm sure, would be involved and Ben Slider would be involved mm -hmm. as well, all three of them. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Last call for any other comments, questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Thank Gary. And I will close that public hearing. And we'll now open um, public hearing 7.2, the 2023-2024 proposed budget and the 2022-2023 estimated actuals. This report will be presented by uh, Clint Rucker, our CBO. And with that, I will open this hearing. Thank you, President Holm, if she's still here, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so yes, thank you. I have the pleasure of presenting our 2023-2024 proposed budget. Thank you to Lisa for starting us off with the LCAP, because the LCAP is actually what defines our budget. So that's actually the plan we use that helps us actually create the blueprint to build out that budget. So because Lisa kind of talked about maybe our main goals, who oh, do I not get? Good, awesome. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we built up the budget and what assumptions we're using for the 23-24 budget. So this is the school services, SSC is School Services of California. They do a lot of work with school districts across the state, helping us kind of identify what we think is gonna happen statewide in terms of increases to 
STIRS, PERS, our COLAs, which is one of the only ways we actually see increased revenue, as well as minimum wage on this one. Um, the piece that I wanted to point out on this, you can see Cal STIRS actually staying pretty steady. They actually have the ability to increase by 1% every year, year over year. Currently, they've said they won't, so we don't see an increase there. Doesn't mean there couldn't be a 1% increase each year. Cal PERS, on the other hand, actually projects out multiple years, and you can see that really steep increase going up about 3.5% over those four year, next four years. Again, that's a percentage district pays on every classified salary that we pay. And then the other piece just to point out is minimum wage. So we see minimum wage constantly increasing. Again, some of these are those costs that no matter what we do, we do not avoid these costs. So PERS, STIRS, uh, step and column, we also have minimum wage. They're ongoing costs the district continues to see and does not avoid. Declining enrollment um, is one of the biggest factors that's been impacting us. I know for those of you who have been on the board and heard me do multiple presentations, I will soapbox for a second and say that it's unfair the state actually doesn't fund us on enrollment but funds us on ADA. That being said, as declining enrollment goes down, our base number of what our ADA is based off of goes down. So. As you can see over the next um, five years, we're actually seeing a huge decrease from 17,125 students all the way down to 14,000. So 3,000 students lost over five years. It's a big hit. Each one of those students, of course, is revenue towards the district for us to be able to fund all of the programs we support. So as we continue to see declining enrollment, we're gonna continue to see a loss in revenue for the district. Just to clarify, um, you may remember this from the May Revised where I shared it. This is not a problem that is a Pajaro Valley Unified School District problem. This is a statewide problem. Um, unfortunately for Santa Cruz County, it's an even bigger problem than statewide. But statewide, you can see we see about an 8.27% decline looking over the next um, 10 years or so to see what actually is happening statewide. And again, just Cross state, we're seeing a lot of declining enrollment. One of the unfortunate factors of that is typically we've seen in the past as you get declining enrollment, revenues will actually go up because you have less students. Therefore, that same pot of money is able to serve more students. Unfortunately, what the governor has been doing is banking on that lately. So he's actually using that to fund the COLAs that he's putting into his budget. So we're not actually seeing that extra jump that we've seen in the past. So you may remember, I talked a bit about this about a year ago when, they first, when we did our 22-23 budget. They added in 22-23 ADA relief where we actually get, they kind of took that cliff that we thought we were gonna have where we we're gonna suddenly hit all of that declining enrollment and lose quite a bit of uh, funding. How it used to work is we used to get either the current year or last year's ADA to use for our funding, whichever was greater of the two. So it was very limited. Either we used last year or we used this year. What the state did is they put in a process where we actually get the average of the prior three years, knowing that as districts are declining in enrollment, this gives districts the ability to actually soften that fall because they're getting the three-year average. So each time you hit, get a big hit in declining enrollment, it doesn't hurt you as badly in that year. Unfortunately, what we're starting to see, as you can see when we get towards 25, 26, we no longer have those large years increasing that average. We're down now to smaller, smaller years, which means our average is gonna to continue to shrink. What that's doing is declining enrollment's actually increasing our deficit spending, because we're actually seeing it happen faster than we anticipated. Um, we anticipated about, as many of you know, we've been losing about 600 students a year for the past few years. This year and next year, we're looking closer to 900 to 1,000. So it's just, especially in Santa Cruz County, it's steepening a lot faster than across the state. So speaking of that, a lot of times we look at the COLA and we look at our revenue and we try to calculate out how much did that mean for us. We often hear if we get a 10% COLA, that's 10% more we have to spend. So if we look at 22-23, in the prior year, so 21-22, we had 203 million in revenue. The COLA was 13.26%. We, we had that 6.56 and then we also had the 6.28 compounded on top of that. So just doing mathematically, that's $27 million above what we should have had last year. That's what a 13.26% would be. However, if you look, our actual revenue ended up $227 million. It's a $24 million increase doing simple math on that one. So $3.3 million roughly is due to either ADA loss or decreases in UPP. In 22-23, we actually saw an increase in UPP. 
So that $3 million from ADA was actually a little bit steeper had we not got that increase to our unduplicated pupil percentage. So you can see in 25, 26 is really where it starts to hurt, even 24, 25. Um, our COLA amounts do not keep up with declining enrollment. So declining enrollment and ADA loss, as a district, we used to be about around 94 to 95% in ADA. Again, statewide, they're seeing about a 4% decrease in ADA. So average daily attendance, students aren't coming to school as often. Obviously with COVID, we know you had quarantines, you had parents who didn't want to bring students to school, understandably so. So we saw a decrease from that, so did the whole state. But because of that, you start to see that 25, 26, we're gonna get roughly about $7.6 million from the COLA, but we're gonna lose about $12.7 million due to our ADA decreasing. So even though we have a prior year of 232, we're getting an increase, our revenue in that last year out is actually gonna go down. Same with if you look at 24, 25, we're actually losing there too, actually the, last, the next three years. So really we're seeing decreases in revenue even though we're seeing those COLAs. So breaking down our budget and how we look at our um, expenditures. So I wanna kinda go through unrestricted and restricted. I believe all the board's familiar by now with unrestricted being the dollars we have the most control over. The state doesn't have as much control over what we can spend them on as long as we're following ed code and we're spending them on our students. For unrestricted, you can see 90.1, 90, 90 so about 90% of our budget goes towards salary and benefits. About 188, almost $189 million is going towards salary and benefits. That leaves about seven million going towards books and supplies, 12.3 million going to services and operating expenses. I'm gonna dig into services and operating expenses in a little bit, because I feel that sometimes that's confusing. Um, as I know some individuals know, Trustee Soto knows, that's also electricity, that's also our gas. It's a lot of our actual just standard needs that the district has that again are unavoidable, we can't change. Um, capital outlay, which is again any of our projects, we've been doing major projects, general fund unrestricted, because the state doesn't give us really money for construction or for facilities, you don't see a lot of improvements coming out of general fund. And then other outgoing uses, that, just to clarify for everyone, that's actually our COPS. So everyone may remember when we bought this building, we did the COPS, that's what that is. So that's actually the only piece that exists in there. I also wanted to break it down just to look at it by function. So these are the same dollars, same dollars for unrestricted, but we also have function. So object is what are you using? So is it salaries, benefits, books, supplies? Function is what are those going towards? What is the goal of those? So you can see 53% and 17% of all of our unrestricted go towards instruction and instruction related services. So about 70%. Now, the other 14% goes to pupil services. So that's our counseling, that's our mental health clinicians. Those are the su other supports for students that the state doesn't consider to be instructional supports, they consider to be pupil supports. So sometimes it's a little bit of a misnomer that you're only spending 53% when in reality that extra 14% is there that they tend to miss when they're looking at the total cost of education. Um, we have some plant services, that's all of our facilities. So we're talking about maintenance, all of our custodial crews, all of that is plant services. General operations, that's gonna be everything that we need to run the district. So when we talk about our payroll department, our human resources department, our finance department, all of those pieces are that make up that 4%. Ancillary services, that's gonna be our, um, ancillary services is gonna be our, sorry, our, um, sorry, it's our athletics. So that's the general fund that we actually contribute to athletics fits into that piece there. So again, talking about the 5,000. So we're looking only at unrestricted. This is this year, what we spent in unrestricted, some of the big hits that we saw in the 5,000. So you can see 2.6 million is PG&E. So that's all of our electricity uh, district-wide. It's actually not our gas. So we actually buy that from a consortium, the Spur Consortium. So that's actually that third one on there. NorCal Relief, that's our insurance that we pay for. We also have, um, we had a workers' comp settlement this year. Um, that actually was reimbursed, so that, again, you see it on the books, but it actually has revenue that comes in and offsets it. Um, Michael's Transportation and Adroit, as you know, we have to serve our students, so we have Michael's as well as Adroit for our special eds, for our special needs students that we rent taxis. Um, AMS, we did the new PVA high paging system. 
So some of the others, I won't go through each one, but you can see those are some of the big ones. Those are really, what I looked at is everything over $200,000 in those 5,000s for unrestricted. And that's the, those are the big ones right there. So then to briefly talk about restricted. So restricted, again, a little harder for us to spend where we want it to spend. We have dollars on the restricted side that we can't spend on, for example, salaries and benefits, or we can't spend on capital outlay or books and supplies. So typically what you see with restricted expenditures, this is more where the state has told us we need to spend them. We still spend about 77.53% of our restricted on salaries and benefits. And then the other big piece is, um, again, those services and operating expenditures, expenses. What you see in that for restricted, a lot of it is our ELOP. So you may remember Jen Bruno coming up here, talking about all of the amazing programs she's been offering to our students. A lot of those are done through our third party vendors that we work with, YMCA, City of Watsonville, um, El Sistema, you have um, our Youth Film Festival. All of those fit into that um, services and operating expenditures. Capital outlay, um, that piece is, larger in restricted mainly because of the board's commitment to using ESSER dollars to actually fund some of the projects we really needed for our sites. So we did a lot of HVAC projects, re-roofing projects, um, adding in better ventilation for um, our sites. So all of those projects would fall under that capital outlay. Then going in again to uh, restricted expenditure, the function, again, looking at that and seeing 75% about is actually instruction or instruction related services. So while it's not necessarily all being spent on salaries and benefits, they are being spent on students. It's direct supports to students. So whether it's providing PVPSA, providing EAOP for our students, that's where those dollars are going. They're going to serve our students. Again, large amount, 10% in pupil services. Um, indirects are those effectively those admin dollars that come into general fund unrestricted to pay for a lot of those general op uh, operating costs, payroll, HR. So whenever we get grants, those require additional um, energy from our staff, additional time from our staff. So state recognizes that and has indirects on all of those. So breaking down again the 5,000s in this category, you can see some of the large ones. We have Arts Council Santa Cruz, which we did a increase th this year through ELOP, um, PVPSA, City of Watsonville, again, for the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program. Um, we have Life Lab, EAOP, YMCA, again, through ELOP. Bay School, which is a requirement for some of our students um, with special needs who actually have to attend, they attend Bay School rather than our school. We, we do still pay for those students. So that's one of the expenditures out of that side. El Sistema, um, Bright Horizons, another special ed uh, school for students. Campus Kids Connection, another ELOP. So just to see, again, the big items that we see in the 5,000s, those over $200,000 um, expenditures. As you can see, there's a pretty common denominator between all of them. There's supports for students, right? PVPSA, EAOP, Arts Council, these are all things to support our students and their education. Okay, when we look at unrestricted and restricted, you saw a lot of those dollars being spent on salaries and benefits. So I just wanted to show a quick breakdown. What are we looking at next year in terms of salaries and benefits? So overall, we have 1,334 uh, certificated positions. 1,078 are in general fund. So those other ones are gonna sit in your fund 12. So those are gonna be your child development, adult education. They're gonna be in um, your they also fall into your charters. All of our charters will be fund nine, so those employees will follow. But in terms of general fund, 1,078. We have 1,046 um, classified positions that are paid out of general fund, and then 133 management or confidential positions. Really, there's only two confidential that fall into that management category. So one piece we talk a lot about, and you'll see if you look at the budget binder that was provided um, on the attached agenda item, Health and welfare increases continue to impact this district severely. Um, this year, we're actually seeing an estimate, we got it from CISC, Santa Cruz County is seeing an estimate of 10% increase on health and welfare benefits. So you can see here that black, uh, or the gold line there represents the percent increase we saw over each year with the blue columns and the dollar amounts showing the dollar increase that that had on our budget. So again, these are dollar amounts that do not impact our employees. They're absorbed by the district as we pay for um, all the benefit increases. So over five years, we're actually gonna see roughly about a $12.5 million increase in benefits alone. 
So again, as we look, think back to that slide, we saw where the colas are not covering the declining enrollment and we're losing dollars, we're still seeing increases that are gonna continue to come, be it the step in column, which is our increases that our staff get through the salary schedule, or the 12.5 million that we're seeing in health and welfare increases. Um, I never thought I would say 10%, I'm glad that it's 10%. They were talking 12 to 15 at one point. So it, it came in, I think they're hoping it'll come in just under 10. Um, they haven't given us the exact number. My view when I hear a company tell me, we're hoping it'll come in in just under 10, I'm expecting to see like 9.9, because they're gonna say, we got you under 10. Because I really think if they thought it was gonna be nine, they'd let us know it was gonna be nine. So I really think it's gonna be really around that 10% mark. So moving into our multi-year projections, looking at what we're looking at for next year and the next two. So whenever we build a budget, we don't just look at next year. We look at next year and the next two years. So I never really get to live in just this year or next year. I'm always living in either the future or the past. I had an old uh, director I worked for who always used to tell me, I will never go into finance because you guys always live in the past or you live in the future. You never live in the present. And um, the more I do it, the more I see it, um, so again, when we're thinking out, I'm not just looking at next year, I'm looking at 24, 25, 25, 26. So one thing I do wanna note, you see that deficit spending um, increasing over there. Actually in 23, 24 and 24, 25, you may remember the board approved that MOU with um, PVFT that was adding a day to the, adding up to four days for them to take throughout the year. That's including that MOU. So those, we're actually not deficit spending in 23, 24 or 24, 25 unintentionally. That's actually due to the fact that we signed the MOU, the board committed those dollars to spend in those years. So our revenue and expenditures are actually balanced out in those two years, but we're spending that one-time money to pay for those days. Um, 25, 26, however, because of that kind of end of that ADA relief and we're seeing the lower um, averages and we're seeing our declining enrollment hit us harder than we thought, we are seeing a bigger decrease. Again. It's something we didn't anticipate. We would see that much declining enrollment. We work with a demographer. They didn't see it coming. I truly believe, I want to clarify, because I know sometimes it sounds like I come up here and say, the sky's falling, look at the $7 million deficit. It's not what I'm saying. I do believe the state has to do something. I think the state has to do something for every district in the next three years to address the fact that every district's declining in enrollment, and we can't keep up with employee salaries, the rising cost of benefits, the rising cost of pers and stirs without the state stepping in and saying, we need to fund education differently. Hopefully what we see is maybe funding through enrollment. I will continue to keep my fingers crossed and hope that that's a possibility. But again, I don't want anyone to think we have a huge concern. It's really, it's just letting you all see the transparency that really that third year out, our revenues are shrinking and our costs are not shrinking. So to keep it on the board's mind, if we don't see changes in the state, we will have to have a conversation about how we start to right size those years out. Thankfully, we have a fund balance that'll pay for that um, deficit. It will most likely cover that deficit through 26, 27 as well, but it's just starting to think about where do we need to maybe shift and be able to save those dollars that we're spending over the revenue we're, we're receiving. Now again, the state may do something, but I, I don't tend to rely on the state to come in and do everything. So we may have to just start looking at that. Um, again, we have that additional 3% reserve. You'll see it's not equal to the required 3% reserve because that was committed by the board at the time when it was 3%. So you can see when the board committed that 3%, we've now our 3% res reserve is about $3 million more than that. So that's how much our expenditures have increased from when we actually initially put that reserve in place. So to talk a bit about what are the upcoming budget challenges we see as we approve this budget and move forward and start to look at first interim, second interim, and we start to kind of really look at those out years. Um, no relief on PERS and STIRS. So in the past, we've seen the uh, governor come in and put dollars specifically to lower those PERS and STIRS rates so they don't go up as much. Rates are continuing to rise on the PERS side. As I noted, STIRS is not increasing, but doesn't mean they can't. They're projected right now to stay steady, but they could fluctuate. As I showed, that increased health and welfare benefits. Expiration of ESSER funding, so as you all know, we received almost $100 million in ESSER funding that was able to provide us with additional supports for students, provide us with some additional programming. Those dollars will expire. The last of them actually expire September 30th of 2024. So we have about a year and two months or so 
before those are gone completely. We will no longer have those one-time dollars to kind of offset some costs and be able to um, pay for some of those big items that really are supports for our students but can't be ongoing because we don't have ongoing dollars. And then as I noted, that those impacts of declining enrollment, I, it's, it's something that does exist statewide and there's only so much we can do about it. So next steps for our budget, um, as you all know, we have a June 17th budget study session, which will be on Saturday. And um, we'll go into more detail of the 23-24 budget, kind of go through each of the object codes and really kind of look and do a deep dive into them. Um, June 28th would be our budget adoption here at the board meeting. Um, 45 day revised if needed. So I put if needed, what the 45 day revise is really meant for is if we see significant changes from the state between the time you all approve the budget on June 28th to when the governor actually signs his budget. Typically the governor will sign it around June 15th, 16th. We don't make changes between that period and this period. So what we end up doing is we approve a budget, come back to the board with the 45 day rest if there's major changes. I'm a little happy to, to inform you and hopefully it'll happen. Um, the legislature actually denied a lot of the governor's cuts to arts and music as well as to learning loss. They want to continue to fund those one-time dollars, so that would be really great for us to be able to have those one-time dollars to fund some of those programs the board had previously approved. Um, we won't know until the governor signs his budget, so you won't see those dollars in this budget because, again, right now we're assuming that what's in May revised is still accurate. Then we have our unaudited actuals, which will be in September, and then, as always, in December, we come back with first interim, which is really an update on what, what has happened throughout the last few months where we have a better idea of what we're actually spending. It's also where you see a lot of our carryover come in because we know what wasn't spent in our prior year that we can now spend in the new year. And then just briefly on the June 17th budget session, um, just some topics as from what I've heard from the board and what we're gonna be going over just to confirm that we have everything you all are interested in seeing. We're gonna look at our 22-23 budget and look at it versus what actually happened with estimated actuals. We'll actually do a deep dive in going through 2023 budget through first interim, second interim to show the updates that we provided throughout the year and how we ended up at estimated actuals. A 23-24 budget review, so as I mentioned, we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive, really talk about what are those thousand certificated positions? Where do they fall? What are they doing? What's, uh, what students are they serving? Same with classified, same with management. Um, we'll do an overview of school accounting practices just to inform the board of why you see fluctuations at time. When we talk about, and for those of you who remember me talking about unearned revenue versus fund balance, two different ways of accounting that we have to account for funds that we receive. Those are important factors to understand as to why we see those shifts. So um, also would like to just know if there's any additional items that the board's really hoping to see on Saturday. And lastly, um, we are gonna provide all of the SACS binders which were attached to this meeting for 23-24. For the 22-23, the first interim, second interim, all of those will be attached. But if anyone would like a printed copy, we'd just like to know because it is hundreds of pages and there's about four different documents. so it's probably around 800 pages or so. We are happy to print them if that's, if you prefer something hard copy, not a problem, but I'm just trying to be a little environmentally conscious. And for those of you who say, I'm happy to look at it on a laptop, we can provide them electronically as well. Thank you, Clint. Um, do we have any public speakers to this agenda item? We do not. Okay, seeing none, um, any discussion from the board? Trustee Scout. Uh, thank you, Clint, to you and your staff for this presentation. And I'll save a lot of my questions for Saturday. And everybody's invited. If you want to dig in with us three, four hours and really get into these numbers, it's going to be really delicious. Um, but I did want to also ask you, I'd heard about enrollment at charter schools and how the various enrollment numbers can affect our budget. If there's anything you can say about that on Saturday. You can, but now if you want, but it's Saturday's fine, too. Yeah, so we have, so there's different types of charters. Um, typically, really, we always refer them as dependent and independent charters. In Ed Code, there's no such thing as dependent and independent, but I think as a district and as um, really a state, we've kind of accepted those as the normal um, rhetoric of what, what we actually call them. Dependent would be the ones that we see as our charter schools. 
So that would be Alianza, Wixa, Diamond Tech, and PCCS. Those are our charter schools. Those are really ones that we feel they're part of PVUSD. We serve them directly. The ones that we see as the more independent would be Navigator, Saba, and Lynn Scott's kind of on the middle ground there. They're a little, they were one of the first charters ever in um, California. So they kind of live in both worlds. So as you see um, enrollment of students going to charters like Navigator and Saba, that does reduce our enrollment, therefore reducing our funding. If we have students going to Alianza and um, WCSA, that doesn't necessarily reduce our funding as a district as a whole, but it does reduce general fund. So we'll see less in general fund, we'll see more in the charter fund. So um, the state recently, or a few years back, actually made it much more difficult for charters to be able to build new charter schools. So gave the boards a little bit more power to stop those from coming in two districts. Um, the last one we had, of course, if for those of you who were on the board, the board actually did deny the charter. They went to the COE. The COE did not support it. They said you can go to the state and the state ended up allowing them to have their charter. We lost about four to 500 students to Navigator because of that charter school. So to your question, um, we do lose students to charter schools. Recently, we haven't seen an increase in loss. Like SABA hasn't taken more. Lynn Scott has not taken more. Navigator got to their cap so they haven't taken more students but all of those students you see in those three schools which is about 1200 students are students that could be coming to pvusd schools thank you can i get a quick follow-up the other thing would be good to know i understand we have general districts have the three percent reserves and we have another three percent on top how um we'd love to see how common that is obviously that's a lot of money and i can see the argument for having extra reserves but that also means money we're not spending in our schools. And I can understand philosophies and different uh, perspectives on that, but it'd be good to know how prevalent that is. And Yeah, absolutely. So the last time I checked, unified school districts were actually at an average of 17%. Um, we're at an average right now with our unappropriated fund balance of about 13, so 10% plus our committed three. So we're actually under what the state was average was about a year ago. Now, of course, we're capped at that 10% um, reserve. So we have the 3% required, but then we have up to 10% that we can actually have each year. After that, we can't actually have a higher reserve. Um, most, di most unified districts, the average was around 17%. I do have an updated number. I can't remember it off the top of my head. I'll happily bring it to Saturday, though. Others? Any other trustees? Oh. Trustee Dodge, Jr. Thank you very much. Um, just two quick questions. Where are you seeing major declining enrollment? What schools specifically are you seeing that are having major declining enrollment is the first question. And the second question is whether if it's the 17th or the 28th, is it possible if you could show us a slide where, you're, where these schools are having declining enrollment? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I can do it at e either one. That's actually not that difficult to get. Off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly where our bubble is. Um, I believe, as I mentioned to the board prior, what we ended up seeing is you would see a bubble of students, so a large number of students that by the time they get to high school, once that bubble falls off, the ones replacing those students aren't as large. So we see, um, just to give an example, we see, say, 500 sixth graders move to seventh grade, but the fifth graders who move to sixth we only get 450. So we actually see a decline, decline. So in terms of which schools, I can provide that either at the 17th or 18th not a, or 28th, not a problem. Um, I don't know off the top of my head which schools we see it. What we tend to see is schools where they'll increase in some grades but decrease in others for an overall decrease. That's a slide I'd like to see. So Absolutely. Trustee Flores? I just want to say thank you for this presentation. It's the most in-depth one that I've seen so far, and I do look forward to Saturday and you know, getting deeper into it, and I hope that we do have a lot of the community members there to also you know, learn with us, but thank you. Of course. Trustee DeSerpa. <coughs> um, I, have no, I don't think I have any further questions. I look forward to Saturday, and um, thanks for this great presentation. Um, yes, I, I'm looking forward to Saturday as well. Thank you, Clint, for, again, I commend you on your presentations are always, in my opinion, great. Um, thank you for that. Um, kind of, uh, I think a follow-up on something with regards to the 
and I, I agree I, with you, I appreciate the terminology that at least I think most of us here recognize the difference between charter schools as we've sort of identified as dependent and independent. Mm -hmm. Um, with regards to the independent, uh, really the two, Navigator and Saba being our two really main independent charter schools that are, are definitely stripping revenue from this district, um, you, you, you had made the comment about the cap that, right, like I think that Navigator's at a cap mm -hmm. and perhaps Saba, but you didn't comment to that, but I think they might be per some city of Watsonville restrictions, not per us. But my question with regards to the cap, for those charter schools particularly, um, because that is directly impacting us as a district. Uh, my understanding is because they are off of our facility site, they could go beyond that number. And there may be other restrictions based on city, res uh, lots of restrictions that they put on them based on where they're located, but not, we as a district cannot restrict them, is that correct? Um, so in their charter petition, it specifically states what that cap is. So when you right. all approved mm -hmm. it. Um, well, we didn't. Well, that's true. <laughs> when the state, for our navigator, when the state approved it, they approved the cap that was within that charter petition. But since, the, is, so, so is that a misunderstanding on my part that since they're not on our facility that they could up that? Or is it still a possibility they could, no, but they it would have. Not. They cannot. They cannot. It doesn't, it's regardless of facility. It's still their charter. So now there, it is true that some schools, um, one of them being like Wixa, doesn't necessarily have a cap. They have a facility cap because they only have so much space. But most of our charters, including both SABA and Navigator, have a, a cap within their charter petition, and they can't exceed that. And they could probably petition to exceed it, but would that be to this district, or since so they got approved at the state, would that Navigator, have to be? it would be at the state level. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you for the clarification on that. And then this was way back an earlier um, part when we were when you had the slide about the stirs and the purrs and how the purrs is going up, but not the stirs, or at least not projected. And you'd comment about the classified employees, right, and how we're paying that for all classified employees, but. Just for clarification, too, we are only paying that for our full-time classified employees that receive benefit, full benefits. I mean, <coughs> if it's a part-time employee working no, so it's, less if than they, 20 or 20, are they not? If they qualify for PERS. So if they qualify, qualification for PERS is roughly about, um, it's around 180 days that they have to work and then they qualify for PERS. So all of our like 181s who are six hours, they do pay, we do pay into PERS for them. Correct. So it's not necessarily tied to if they receive benefits, it's tied to if they qualified through PERS through the number of hours or that they're a full-time position. So Over when we, 180. If yeah. we hire a, so it's, I think it's actually around 200 days if you just work as like um, a day-to-day -day employee, but if you actually are a contracted employee, like an IA, for example, they receive PERS. It's, it's part of their requirement. And I can look back to my finance fee. Was it 1,980 hours? Is that what it is? Do I remember correctly? 1,980 hours. So, but do, we do have some group of classified employees that aren't, we're not paying into PERS for? Very few. We, and if okay. we don't, we pay into ours. There's an alternative retirement system that we pay into. It's much less. The percentage is much lower, but very few. But very we are few. Doing something all of our employees that we hire for permanent positions all receive PERS. Okay. Yeah, even our, even our four hour a day employees. All right, thank yeah. you for the clarification on that. That's all of my questions. Any other questions or comments from the board? Okay, well, I will thank you and um, thank you and Ms. Aguirre for um, keeping that so timely with the length of tonight's meeting. Yes. Um, would the board um, please let us know which, um, oh. who would like to yes. have a printed copy because we, we don't want to do, provide 800 pages of um, information that will then just go into the trash. So we'll happily do it, but if we could actually get the indication right now, that would be good because this is Saturday and we're already at Wednesday night. So if we can, um, if people can let us know which um, by sign of hands or however you'd like to do it, but we'd like to know, please. All, sorry, all the electronic copies will be posted tomorrow morning. We'll post all of the prior um, SACS binders. I, it'd be nice to have one paper thing we could look at there. I don't know if we all need one, but if we could, I don't know. I, I would like, I like paper.
Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And I will close this public hearing. And now <clears throat> we will move to public hearing um, item 7.3, the Special Education Local Plan report. This report will be presented by Heather Gorman, our Director of spe uh, Special Services and self So your third and last public hearing for the evening. Good evening. Um, well, President Holm, if she's here, Vice President um, Acosta, Board of Trustees, Cabinet Members, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Heather Gorman, the SELPA Director. This is a public hearing to present our special education um, proposed local and budget service plans. Oh, that's not how it looked when I <laughs> sent it. That's okay. So for tonight's agenda, I'll go over the annual service plan and the budget plan. I really hope to paint a bit of a picture on how um, the budget and the service plan has a really strong relationship together. Um, special education is a program that's mandated by the Individuals with Disability Act. This legislation was originally passed in 1997 and underwent a revision in 2004. California laws comply with the federal statutes. And so I'm here tonight because of one of those statutes. <laughs> so I thought I would start with the service plan. In special services, we, act, we assess students and find areas of need. As an IEP team, we, de we develop goals to support those identified needs, and these needs drive the amount and intensity of services that students need to make growth. Services are delivered by people and while I'm starting with the service plan, the budget and the service plan goes hand in hand. In the supporting board documents that are attached, you'll see the definition of all the services that we, apply, we um, provide to our students. Since we are a single SELPA district, we provide services not only to pre-K 12 students, but birth to 22. We provide services to 3,393 students from our June Cyrus count. At times, I think there's a perception that we, special services, are not moving forward in testing enough students. However, our numbers show a different story, and we are above the 13 state average for students identified with special needs. When considering the services PVUSD provides to students with disabilities, we also need to consider the budgetary impacts of those services. It costs on average 50.5% more to ensure that students with disabilities achieve the same academic growth as their peers without disabilities. The best place to start this work, of course, is in the general education classroom. In addition, students that have other needs such as socially economically disadvantaged or English learners incur additional costs and this varies by students primary disability. So when we look at the primary disability there's 13 categories that students can be found eligible under. This graph shows that almost half of the students with disabilities are qualified under specific learning disability SLD. Another 25 percent are speech and language only. Students under these eligibilities are not considered severe However, what I would like to draw your attention to is the number of students with autism. At the end of the school year, we had 291 students who have qualified with a primary disability of autism. So you may ask, why is this notable? As you can see through this graph, there's been a statewide trend that students with relatively severe disabilities have increased. In fact, the numbers have almost doubled since 2000-2001. Autism is one of the categories that can be considered severe and may need a variety of services. Specifically, our autism numbers have grown from 176 in 1920 to 291 this year. Other severe disabilities can include medically fragile students, students with, that require therapeutic classrooms, behavior and social emotional needs, and some of our low incidence disabilities like deaf and visually impaired. Behavior and social emotional needs also continue to grow. 
So noted on this slide are all the services that may be provided to any individual student. Students with more severe disabilities require more services to grow and all districts are required to provide 42 different services to students with disabilities depending on what assessments tell us. Which helps us to focus on student needs. If you consider a student with autism, they may have more complex needs and could require specialized academic program, speech services, OT services, behavioral support, and or adaptive physical education or nurse services, and that's just for one student. Compared to a student with a specific learning disability that may require specialized academic instruction. And of course, this is all individualized on student needs. So next, that brings us to the budget portion of our annual plan. So for the budget, we have to look at our funding source, which I will discuss uh, on a later slide. And this funding goes to the Special Education Local Plan Area, or SELPA, um, ours being a single district SELPA. So we don't split the funds between different LEAs like multi-district SELPAs do. The funds are given to the administrative unit, the superintendent or their designee, one being the SELPA director, then those funds are distributed to students to provide specialized services. All students are funded at a base rate, then in addition to that, the state and federal funding are added to support students with disabilities. That does not cover the cost, the entire cost, um, so there is a local contribution from the general fund. According to the California Department of Education, the SELPA state base rate for the fiscal year of 22-23 school year was $820. When we are considering this base amount, we also have to consider that general increases in staff and staff salaries and pension costs, you've heard Clint's presentation, according to um, about a third of the recent increases in expenditures. The remaining two-thirds is due to a rise of incidents in students with relatively severe disabilities. It does cost more to provide services to students with complex needs. So as I mentioned, the majority of our budget is spent on staff salaries and benefits. Specifically here, it's 89.89% on salaries and benefits. 7% is spent on supplies and 3% on other things, for example, the amount, the portion of the amount that we pay to help run the facilities. When we look at our funding sources, um, where we get our money from, this year is very similar to the past two years, with the state funding about 35% of our budget, the federal revenue funding 10%, and this leaves the local contribution at about 55% of our budget. The state average is about 60% um, percent of the funds come from local contributions. And so for the last three years, this is um, what it looks like, that how our budget has broken out. And as you can see, that the percentages have stayed very um, similar. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gorman. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Thank you. With that, um, do we have any questions, any comments from the board? Uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. Thank you very much. Um, so you said we're the only district who is running SELPA? No, we're a single SELPA district. Other districts, um, like Santa Cruz, they have a multi-district SELPA, so their SELPA, or their special education local plan, covers several different LEAs, and we just have the one SELPA and the one district. When was that decision made? Do we know? It was way back before my time. I think it was in 1970s. I could look up, but it's, it's been that way for a long time. I don't have the exact date. And so SELPA's costing us $32 million, it said? That's what it funds to, um, that's what it costs to fund all of special services. Okay, so, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other trustees? Trustee DeSerpa? Of that sum that you just mentioned, and maybe you said this in your presentation, but just to call it out again, how much of that is funded by the state and how much of it comes from our general fund? So 
if we go back, oh, I went the wrong way. So this is that the slide here. The state revenue is 35 percent in total, and the federal revenue is 10 percent. And so then the local contribution from the district is 55. 55 percent. Yep. Of what the total. So that cost. comes from the general fund, the 55 percent. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so I just wanted everybody to hear that as well. Yeah, I think that comes back to that 50.5 percent that you noted, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. Trustee Flores, did you have a comment at senior? No, same same slide. I think that we're all kind of our, wrap, wrapping our heads around. Um, the state expects us to be able to g provide these services with what they're giving us, but obviously it can't be done. We, it's yeah, more expensive than they're giving us. So. Yeah. We need to start we need to advocate to the state that they're not giving us enough right and this has always been an underfunded i mean special services has always ever since the conception of it when i talk that you know in 1997 um when they created idea they were thinking that you know the state and federal funds would cover about 70 percent and it has never covered that much so we have always had to, and, and I did mention that the state average of the local contribution is about 60% of LEAs are paying about 60%, so we're close to what the state average is, but it's not totally funded with funds from the state and federal government. Any other comments from any other trustees? Yeah, um, I'll just add, you know, as the federal representative who traveled out to D.C. and met with our state senators and representatives on this topic, advocating specifically for this along with CTE, our career technical education, and um, also our, um, with, um, our food plans, it's just, that's a hard lift. It's a hard, hard, hard lift, um, and we haven't seen much increase in movement in that, and from I really shame our federal government for that 10 percent. That that is just horrific. That that's all we're getting at that level. So all I could say is we continue to advocate for more money. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gorman. Mm -hmm. so with that, I will close this public hearing. And now we will move to our visitor non-agenda items. Um, item 8.1 the public comment this is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening please know that um, though our the brown act does prohibit the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items the board is listening and hearing you uh, so uh, trustee flores do we have any public comments tonight we do okay I will call three names at a time. If you could please come up to the podium. I have Adrian Fernandez, Alejandra Vaca Perez, and Sandra Moore. And I'm sorry, no, I forgot to note that um, two minutes per each public comment. Can you hear me? Does, do I have three minute help? No? Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce myself before you start the timer. Can I do that? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Adrian Fernandez. I'm one of the academic counselors at PV High School. Uh, I'm here with some of my colleagues, and we're here to share some concerns. Um, one of them being um, concerns regarding the Power Valley High School Wellness Center project. Uh, and, and the second one would be concerns raised by counselors uh, across the district uh, regarding the coordinator of counseling programs. So um, the first item again, so these concerns are going to be um, based on PV High for the first item. So this item, um, the, the Wellness Center project, um, PV High staff consider, uh, you know, that, that it's been, uh, you know, there's been poor planning in it. Um, we know that there is a need, you know, of wellness centers in the community to service the student community. Um, it's just the planning of it. It has been really poor, 
you know, um, and it's a vulnerable time right now. And I'm saying vulnerable because um, our principal is going to be resigning, our assistant principal, one of our assistant principals is resigning, and then we have Dr. Rodriguez that's going to be resigning. So um, it's just a lot of things happening that, you know, it just wouldn't make sense to, to start this project at the time at Pajaro Valley High School. Um, and then uh, some concerns raised by, by my colleagues at Pajaro Valley High are, um, about this project is the lack of transparency with the project planning and timelines. And then uh, the second one would be no input was solicited from on-site staff that will be impacted with office space. The third one was the rush decision to carry on such a project without, cons consult without consulting a trained professional to advise on facilities needed or make recommendations of an alternative location. Um, and another uh, concern it was that staff were feeling pressured. We were feeling pressured with the relocation of office space, um, and they felt intimidated by this person making these decisions. Um, and they didn't know what to say or what to do to have their voices heard, so I'm being their voice today here. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of them. Um, some of the suggestions that they made, um, or solutions and suggestions that they, they, they wanted you guys to hear tonight. I'm, I'm sorry, but that is time. I'm using their time oh, they, Coll they, collectively. They need to speak for themselves. Yeah, so okay. can you call the next card and have them say if they want? The yes. no. okay. okay, so collectively we're using our times. Uh, and then we're using Ms. Spina's time. We, uh, yeah, that is not like our, our typical order policy. It's two minutes per person. So if each of you could speak, that would really help for us to keep in compliance with our board policy. The thing is that we, we I'm the spokesperson tonight, so um, I'm the one that, that, that prepared to, to speak to you tonight for them. If you guys can please hear me out. And there, there's more to, to add to this. So it's really important that our community listens. It's, 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 it, you're asking us to do something that's out of the compliance of our board policy. This, this standard was set by the board some time ago, how this is done, and each speaker only gets to speak for his or herself for the two minutes, and they're both, you're, you're standing here, you're free to speak whatever comments you want, but we have to stick to our board policy. Can I just provide you, well, you know what? The, and you're, you're free to provide us with any written material. We'll, well take that, but we are also willing to hear from both of the, pres, these pres, women that pres, are standing pres, next to you. Can just read it? This. Okay. Point of order. I'm going to close did out we, mine. Thank Excuse you. me. Did we call the other two cards yeah, right they after have one been after called. another? Okay, and so who is speaking next? Well, we all kind of wanted him to be our speaker. You've heard that that's not the board policy, so who's speaking next? Alejandra Vaca Perez is the next speaker that was called. So I'm going to pass on um, the mic to my colleague Alejandra. She'll be speaking on regards to the second item that we wanted to share is the petition to reconsider the PUSD coordinator of accounting programs. Um, and this is a petition. Um, that is held up by, mm -hmm. by all of our counselors okay. across the district. Okay. We'll need Alejandra to come and speak at this time because we are well past two minutes now. Uh, good evening, board members. Good evening, um, welcome. My name is Alejandra. I'm a social emotional counselor at PV High. This is my fifth year. Um, so this petition was collected um, from multiple PVUSD counselors in our department um, that represent different uh, grade levels, school sites, elementary to high school. Um, this is um, one of the statements that um, was agreed upon to share um, with you tonight. Um, as a counseling team, we strongly believe in the advocacy for the position of PVUSD coordinator of counseling programs, as it would have allowed us the opportunity for collaboration, enhancement of services, and elevation of professional development. We believed in having a leader who could guide counselors to successfully work in unity. Unfortunately, the counsel coordinator of counseling programs has struggled to include the diverse voices, perspectives, and input as counseling professionals to facilitate a professional collaborative learning environment. As a result of excluding these diverse counselor voices, this has impacted us as working professionals and impeded the implementation of best practices for the counseling department while diminishing positive outcomes for the educational communities and stakeholders of PVUSD. Some of the challenges 
Some of the challenges that we have encountered as a department are the following, but are not limited to um, the coordinator's lack of knowledge, experience, and understanding of counseling roles and their ethical obligations while leading our counseling programs over the past year, providing misleading information and directives related to middle school promotion, creating divisions amongst counselors by not hosting collaborative meetings, unsupportive of counseling resources needed to effectively carry out tasks and counselor responsibilities, counselor trainings not carried out by a trained professional in topic of need, and then uh, inconsistency with counseling meetings, uh, rushing through our counseling agenda, not giving opportunities for counselor input to collaborate on agenda planning in advance. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So she she can she can do this part. This center. Yes, I'm Sandra, but Humana can take this, the second part. Oh, there were four, four of us. No, so I, I don't need because my concern was already addressed. Yeah, that was the first mm -hmm. concern. Humana. Okay, so the next two speakers I have is Humana Ospina and Martha uh, Belayic. So to continue on with the concerns, right here. Uh, a good evening, uh, members of the PVUSD. I am continuing with the inconsistency in support in supervising role, including evaluations, intimidation, and silence of specific counselors. To do to, to these concerns, we are signing this petition to demonstrate our disapproval pert pertaining to this coordinator role and we request a performance review of the current coordinator of counseling with the consideration and feedback from all stakeholders. It is in imperative that our counseling department has a leader with a counseling credential who understands the need of our counseling profession, has the passion to elaborate the counseling department working together to meet the needs of our students, families and school community who is familiar with resources and someone who can lead by example. To conclude, we need a counseling leader who will advocate for the students and counselors' needs moving forward, the being professional and understanding of the standing of the standards and meet sets with the counseling profession and maintaining an inclusive, collaborative and a team center approach. Thank you for your time and consideration as we work closely to find a solution to this matter. The PVUSD counseling team is hopeful that together we will reach a healthy and a safe working environment for all. And uh, we have counselors from what uh, Alejandra mentioned, uh, from elementary school, middle school, and the high schools, and socio-emotional counselors. We appreciate your time. And we hope that uh, the open mind could create uh, a an, an, uh, healthy and professional environment for all, because we are providers for the services as well. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Olivia. Members of the board, my name is Marta Belayich. It appears that has, there has been yet another Saba Charter School student accident in the industrial zone. Witnesses observed that during the afternoon of May 16th, a Saba student riding his bicycle from school ran through a stop sign at the intersection of 2nd and Walker Streets and T-boned a pickup truck traveling south on Walker Street. Based on bystander accounts, the child fell off his bicycle and sustained minor injuries. The driver stopped, placed the bike in the back of his truck, and drove the child somewhere. No crossing guard was seen. A police report was filed. This marks the third SABA student injury in the industrial zone. In December 2019, two SABA students were hit while walking to school on Walker Street and sustained major injuries, requiring them to be airlifted out of the county. 
The two most incompatible zoning designations between each other are heavy industrial and children's schools. Yet Seba's location is in the heart of the industrial zone, adjacent to a large alcohol distributor, plastering and landscape contractors, cold storages, agricultural fields, and a major state highway. Heavy truck traffic is common here. A registered professional traffic engineer analyzed issues related to Seba in advance of Watsonville City Council's meeting on Seba zoning. The analysis explained that proper school placement should adhere to the California Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, emphasizing uniformity to prevent dangerous conditions for drivers and students. The report concluded that Seba's location in a heavy industrial zone is not typical for schools and would not allow for a uniform school traffic plan. Continuing Seba student traffic accidents in the industrial zone provide ongoing evidence that children's schools do not belong in the industrial zones and should not be located in them. Thank you. Was that the last of our public speakers? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you for all who showed up this evening to speak. Um, moving now to our employee organization comments. This is the time that we hear from our employee organizations. Each organization will have uh, five minutes to speak. We will start with uh, the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Good evening, trustees, uh, President Holm, maybe. Not sure if she's here, <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so, of course, I want to start by uh, thanking Dr. Rodriguez um, for your service to PVUSD. Um, we wish you very well on your next endeavor and know that you will succeed in Stockton Unified. Um, I actually started in this district 10 years ago and I had no idea what the superintendent looked like. And I can say without a doubt that when Dr. Rodriguez came here, everybody knew who Dr. Rodriguez was within the first few months of her being here. And that was a pretty amazing thing for most of my colleagues. Um, and then coming into this position in union leadership, um, I had the pleasure of starting when the pandemic hit. And um, so we, we weathered some very interesting years together uh, with zero roadmap. And um, PVSD faced some challenges that no other district, I think, has faced before. So I appreciate your collaboration and your dedication to the students and the staff and the families here in this district through all of that. It was a, a crazy couple of years, for sure. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Um, we, PVFT, look forward to working with the board on um, looking for and, and hiring a new superintendent to continue that, that good work in our service to this community. So I just wanted to say that up front. Um, there's a lot of things on this agenda. You guys really have packed this agenda <laughs> tonight. So um, I do want to acknowledge the collaboration and work with PVUSD. We have a MOU on the agenda tonight to address um, some of the impacts of the expanding the Save to Music, the Save the Music program um, for our VAPA folks. And so I really appreciate the work that we were able to um, do with the district in securing some uh, some agreements, you know, to to secure limitations on the workload impacts for those folks. So thank you very much for that. Um, you also saw a SALPA presentation and I do want to acknowledge the, we, what we call the contribution to the SALPA. Um, and as, as uh, Trustee Acosta said, we need to continue advocating at the state level with legislators at the federal level uh, SELPA is not funded in the in the way it needs to be and a lot of that contribution is basically staffing, right? That's paying for the actual people who provide those services to our students. Um, and I also want to acknowledge, because I've heard at a lot of board meetings, how we have 
over identified sometimes is said um, our SELPA population here and if you're not familiar PVFT started um, it was part of an organization called SAS which stands for safe agriculture safe schools and they work on pesticide regulations and I just think it's really important to acknowledge that I think a lot of the uh, special ed diagnoses in our area come from over pesticide use that is rampant in the areas around our school district so as trustees I would really encourage you to look up SAS and participate in some of their meetings they are held online um, and they're really important to this community um, let's see what else is on the agenda tonight the budget yes as Clint mentioned we are in declining enrollment um, we are also declining in our uh, FTEs of certificated staffing so when I first started we had I think close to 1300 teachers we're about mm, 1100 maybe now so as we as we experience the declining enrollment we work really hard with HR and it's a collaborative effort so I appreciate that to not have to go through a layoff process and what we do is we we adjust based on attrition so as people retire as people resign as people leave we adjust where those staffing needs are and that has been pretty successful over the years so yes there is declining enrollment but there's also declining cost due to declining staff just wanted to point that out and um, I have not been in the classroom in four years and I am in summer school right now and shout out to Jen Bruno she's fantastic it's amazing <laughs> thank you Let me, um, California School Employees Association CSEA do we have anyone here that's going to speak on behalf of CSEA okay seeing none we will move on to Pajaro Valley Association of Managers Pavam do we have anybody here this evening to speak on behalf of Pavam thank you <clears throat> good evening president home board of trustees and superintendent dr. Rodriguez my name is Chrissy McLean and I am the coordinator of academic and social emotional counseling programs I'm gonna bring as much love and light into this room so that I can get through this exciting report that I'm happy to bring to you from the Pajaro Valley Association of Managers First off, I want to congratulate our assistant superintendents of elementary and secondary for coordinating a very engaging and fruitful Administrators Academy last week on June 4th and June 5th. It was powerful to see so many folks connecting from across grade levels, across sites, and also across departments from the district. This was a great opportunity to come together to further our district's initiatives while connecting, celebrating, and strengthening our teams to really set the tone for next year's service to our students and our community. Personally, I'm here to also provide an update to the board and the community about the um, SB HIP grant, which you've heard about in the past, in past meetings. So just an update, these last few months have been instrumental and our focus has been on building our behavioral health and wellness programs at every tier through June 2025. In the advancement of PVUSD's commitment to a multi-tiered system of support model, one of the projects written into the grant is creating new spaces that provide students with a tiered support. In other words, mental health focused wellness spaces in the schools. Bringing wellness spaces to our schools is a very exciting direct service project. The vision is to create wellness spaces at each school starting with an elementary, a middle school, and a high school as our first models. These wellness spaces would incorporate a tier one or universal support area like a wellness room with stations to help students reset, reconnect, pause, and also includes a clear system on how students can access more support if needed. These spaces would be available to all students and be known as a safe space. The ideal wellness space also has a connecting or an adjacent smaller room for small groups or tier two supplemental resources for students needing a little more consistent reteaching of skills and or connecting around emotional support. 
Third, there would be adjacent one or two offices where staff could pro provide tier three or individualized support for students. Each tier of support would be located in the school's wellness space. In an even more perfect model, the nurse would be b nearby as well. Currently, Ann Soldo has the available space and has committed to being the home of the first elementary wellness center space. Cesar Chavez Middle School has committed to being the middle school model, and we would love for PV High to be the high school model. We are currently working with site administration to identify potential spaces that can support the three-tiered su support model wellness space. Another portion of the grant is dedicated to increasing the capacity of our staff at all tiers. A few schools, including Watsonville High School Summer School, have already received trauma resiliency training. And just today, we concluded PVUSD's first two-day suicide first aid training, ASSIST. This training will occur three times a year and be offered to many staff. These last two days, we train teachers, administrators, counselors, early education staff, and SELPA staff all together in this suicide intervention model. Keep your ears open and your eyes peeled at each board meeting for the next few months as we are increasing connections with community partners through this grant in order to provide more support for students. I'm honored to serve as a coordinator of counseling, academic and social emotional counseling, and I look forward to providing and sustaining safe spaces, supporting belonging, and instilling agency for PBUSD students and staff. Thank you for allowing me to do the PAVAM report. Okay. You have, if, if you have anything, you can note it down. Um, thank you. Um, Communication Workers of America, CWA. Do we have anyone here this evening from there? Okay, seeing none. We will now move on to our action items, um, starting with action item 10.1, our 2021-2022 annual independent audit. Uh, this report will be presented by our CBO, Clint Rucker. And I think you have a couple of sidekicks with you this evening. <laughs> Ahmad, Eddie, yeah, there we are. Thank you, Vice President Acosta, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So yes, I'm here to present our 21-22 um, financial audit. So every year, as required by Ed Code, we are required to do an audit on our prior year. So this is not for 22-23 that we're finishing up right now. It's actually for 21-22. Typically, um, these are, by Ed Code, required to be done by January 31st due to the impacts of COVID and a lack of staffing across the state, also impacting our auditors as well. Um, we actually got an extension through the COE as well as the state controller's office. So everything has been approved. The extension was approved. So I do have a mod here to speak briefly to our audit and confirm that the independent audit was done as according to state standards. So Ahmad. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. My uh, name is Ahmad Gouraibe. Uh, well, I'm from my belly, the firm that is the independent auditor for the school district. Uh, scope of the audit is to ensure that the financial statements are fairly stated. And so uh, the way that we do the audit, we split the audit into basically three phases. Uh, we, the first phase is the interim phase. This is the phase when we look at your internal controls. Uh, we look at the manner that you process receipts, the manner that you process disbursements, the manner that you process payroll. We like to see review processes, segregation of functions and duties in there. Then we wait for management to close the books, and then it's a process of confirming the balances that are reported on these financial statements. Effectively, these financial statements are an affirmation of what has been previously presented to you by management. We just come in after the fact, and we confirm these numbers with external parties. And then the last phase of the audit is to ensure that these financial statements are in accordance with the uh, the reporting standards, the accounting standards, they call them GASBs, Government Accounting Standards Board. And so we work with uh, management to ensure that these financial statements met these standards. Every year or so, there's a couple of accounting standards that are changing uh, for these districts out there. And so the district ensures that these are in accordance with these standards. Um, along with that, you are a government, so you receive federal funding. You did receive quite a bit of some COVID funding. Um, from CARES, CRESA, and ARP. So we performed, uh, you know, 
added procedures with respect to these uh, grants. It is a federal requirement that you undergo what they call a single audit. State compliance is another one that we take a look at. Um, so the, w the way that you report your attendance, I will require to issue opinion on these financial statements. I'm pleased to let you know that we issued a clean opinion on these financial statements, meaning uh, they are fairly stated in all material respects. It's not a 100% test, it's a sampling. We pick the material items that are reported in the financial statements. And uh, we also audited the federal compliance and the state compliance, and we issued a clean opinion on those as well. And with that, I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Do we have any public speakers to this? I need clarification from Ron Sandage. You just have 10, which I, t t item on 10. Ron Sandage? 10. You'll need to submit another card for 10.3, but I'll put 10.2 on this one. Can you do that? I don't know. We can do a card submitted for each. Yeah. Oh, OK, so you'll 10.2. Okay, so we do not have any for this item. Right, I'm just going to have to, Ron, create a point of, I want to create a point of clarification for you for that. If you're going, the action item can only be spoken to after it's presented. So if you're going to speak to 10.2, Trustee Flores has a card for that. If you're going to speak to item 10.3, you can only speak to it when 10.3 comes up and you would need to submit another speaker card for that item prior to that item being started on the agenda. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sorry, we have no public comments. Okay, and with that, then I will bring it back to the board. And I um, also just want to note um, for the record that, because um, I think some are confused, that uh, President uh, Trustee Dr. Holm is not with us anymore this evening. She had to leave. So um, just so everybody can know that, I'm not ignoring her. She's not here. <laughs> so. Comments, questions from the board? Yes, Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, I'd just like to, to thank you for coming. You know, I, I think it's always great when we're asking for reports. You know, it's not just, oh, well, I'm just reading this report on behalf of, um, but I just want to say thank you. And did you come all the way from somewhere or, or do you reside here? I did come over the hill. I, I would, I'm in San Jose. Okay, thank you for coming. It's against traffic. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. Thank you for um, coming tonight. So from what I can see through your executive summary and your comments, um, there really were no significant findings. Is that correct? That's correct. So and is that common for school districts of this size? Uh, yes and no. Uh, uh, so it, it all depends on management and what they do with the way that they report the financial statements, their internal controls. Uh, this district is structured well. So we were able to obtain all the, requ the required documents that we needed from the district. And, you know, yes, I mean, uh, sometimes it is common. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, can I have an motion? Make then? a motion to approve. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Scow. With that, I have a first, I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 601, just to make sure I'm clear. Okay, Thank um, you. next item. Thank you. 10.2, Visual and Performing Arts at Elementary Level. Um, this report will be presented by our Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, Superintendent of Schools. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. So as you all heard from the presentation that Stephanie Monroe did um, just a few weeks ago, we've really made some really great strides in the area of visual and performing arts. So it started out with the support of Sue Galti and then now is um, continuing with the support of um, of Stephanie Monroe, something that we've been very vocal at, so something that I do frequently is um, we set a goal and then we prove to accomplish it. So in 2019, we set out a goal 
of ensuring that every single student in PVUSD elementary student was going to have access to 45 minutes worth of music instruction. So this was actually released in 2019 and on point. Um, we are um, at the five year mark and are at now at all 16 um, schools are going to have um, music instruction. And so because of that, coupling that with declining enrollment um, and then also our contractual obligations to provide release to all elementary teachers, um, we have done a shift in that. Um, and so this past year, about 50% of our music teachers were providing release. The other 50% were not. As was mentioned by Roddy, we often do things by attrition so that we do not harm our staff or we try to, um, we try to limit um, the impact on our staff. And so what is happening, I think there's a, mis there's a misunderstanding that we are taking um, art away and that we're actually reducing um, visual and performing arts. So it is accurate that we're increasing music more than we are increasing art. Um, what we have done um, is because of the inclusion of the last three, um, the last three schools, we now have a music teacher or except for in one case, which um, we just um, talked about today, but in we are going to be able to have a music teacher and so therefore we have asked our art teachers to split. Um, and so what it's going to be is similar to what it was previously. So next year, um, the optimal, which will be what is at most, is that we will have um, music for our element, for our, all of our students. We will have K2 or possibly K3. We will have art. And then we will have science um, for um, three through five or sometimes four through six. Um, it's all based on us trying to make sure that students have good science instruction, good music instruction, and that we also meet our contractual obligations, which is that teachers receive their allotted minutes of, um, of resource. So yes, um, we have not in the past right size resource, or I keep saying resource teachers, that is not accurate, excuse me, release teachers, and they actually don't like to be called that, so I'll call them specialty teachers. So the specialty teachers, we have not right size the specialty teachers, and so what that caused was a disparity between schools. So some schools had a lot of additional release teachers, and some schools had just the minimum amount of release teachers. So part of what we also tried to do was to right size that and ensure that all school sites have a little bit over the release teacher amount that they need, but that we don't have any one school site that has significantly more FTE, which means full-time teaching position, um, additional FTE. Because at this point, we have some sites that have one and a half over and we have other sites that are struggling to make their release time minutes. And so we did this. Um, so um, in terms of Prop 28, so then there's a lot of conversation about Prop 28. So Prop 28 is not as clear as we would like to. So the state has not released any type of templates. Um, and then they also, they have not, answered one very, very important question, which is, can you pay with Prop 28 for current teachers or, or current programs, or does it have to be above and beyond what you currently are doing? So um, although it's not optimal, if we do do some reductions in this area, it possibly could in, in the end assist us because it will allow us to use that Prop 28. Um, in just one more second. Um, and Prop, Prop 28, um, you know, we've been asking that question for several months and we haven't received it. But that's important for us to know because if we misuse the block grant funding, we would have to repay that back with general fund. And that it, we do not have. So um, 
that is something that I wish we had the answer to, but we currently do not have the answer to the Prop 28 question at this point. Um, and I will um, end the report at this point um, and allow public speakers. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do. I will call you up three at a time. I have Ron Sandage, uh, Rihanna Hurt, and Kat Chien. Visual and performing arts includes everything that you can imagine. And many of the people in this room have either played a musical instrument, taken up a camera, painted a picture, and you can see it on the walls around this room and around the district. We need to encourage that to keep it going. Anything and everything that you as a board of trustees can do to encourage students to participate families to support the students and to make sure that there's uh, qualified teachers in the classroom to make the arts continue is your responsibility and I highly encourage you to find the resources from now until the end of time to make sure that we have a quality visual and performing arts program in this school district. I yield my time. Thank you for including the topic of visual and performing arts plans on the agenda today. I appreciate the continuous support for the arts in PVUSD. My name is Rhea Hurt, and I'm an artist and public school educator currently working as an instruction and curriculum coach for PVUSD. I also teach for the University of uh, California Santa Cruz <laughs> Masters in Education program, teaching how to teach art. In total, I have over 20 years teaching and art world experience, including running a nonprofit arts organization in Brooklyn, New York. My personal artwork is displayed internationally. I tell you this to share how serious I am about arts and arts education. I moved to Watsonville and started working for PVOSC a few years ago. In my role, I understood the LCAP arts plan included both music and visual arts specialists at the elementary level. I was surprised to hear the plan had changed. It was especially alarming when I knew Prop 28 funding was voted into law last November. From my work at the nonprofit, I understand how funding can be challenging when budgets are hard pressed. I understand that lower attendance and lower enrollment means fewer dollars. Studies show that attendance improves when students are engaged in arts programming. When there is a community backed plan in place and state voters also voted to fund the arts, it's incongruous to phase out visual arts programs. Instead, I think we should continue with the plan to build. We should maintain the programs that were in place last year. I'm not sure if folks understand the impact it will have on sites to lose their visual arts specialists, even 50%. For instance, MSD school community will suffer if Lucia Herrera is split between two sites. Her program is completely integral to that school. Students benefit from her expertise and experience as a top-notch bilingual educator. We need to keep instructors like Lucia at their sites and use her as an example of excellence. Good evening, uh, board members and cabinet. My name is Kat and I work at Mitzi White as the art teacher. I came to say thank you. I just got information yesterday that I will be staying full time at my site. Um, I'm not sure how that happened, but I am grateful. Um, I was originally going to come here tonight because I found out the news uh, and then parents were going to come and speak to you about the impacts of the art program and how they value it. Um, and I got a lot of texts back saying that they were really happy to hear that I'm going to be there. Um, however, it does make me sad for the sites that won't have an art teacher next year. I would like to keep encouraging you all to think about how to make sure that all sites continue to have or get art from kinder to middle school. By the way, my son's artwork is on the wall. Um, had he not had art, I don't know, he might not have really understood, uh, like been impacted by it. Um, I often get older students from the past stop me to ask uh, when they will get art again. Uh, the students crave and want art. Uh, we really have an opportunity ahead with Prop 28 funds to 
cultivate a well-rounded VAPA program throughout our district, and I really hope that we can keep adding to it. Maybe we can even be a model district for our state. Wouldn't that be exciting and have something to strive for? Thank you for listening and considering the future of VAPA. Sorry, the next three are Christina Carter, Lucia Herrera, and Adriana. Good evening, thanks for listening. I'm a bilingual classroom teacher, and I am here this month again to talk about uh, my support of and concern for visual and performing arts at PVUSD. Um, thankfully, you just heard me at Minty White, I have retained our full-time art teacher, Kat, and we're so happy about that. Um, I interpret this to mean that our K through second grade students will have two hours of art per week in a very well thought out and development, developmentally sequential program. This is how it should be for all students at all schools. Please continue to support visual arts at least K through at all the elementary schools. In regards to music education, I'm concerned that music will end up competing with visual arts and that it does not appear clear how or what music education will be taught nor to whom, at least at, at this point from what I know. Um, I encourage PVUSD to develop a comprehensive music program with clear and achievable objectives and I do not believe that much measurable learning and engagement can be achieved with only 45 minutes of music education a week. That's what it looks like from the paperwork I've seen. Um, as we reiterate in our classrooms daily, how do we get better at anything? We are learning. Practice, practice, practice. And I don't think that'll happen with just 45 minutes a week. I think it will be watered down. Um, I encourage PVUSD to look back to music education of the 70s and maybe 80s in California. I'm a product of that program at public education. At that time, all fourth graders who wanted to learn instrumental, an instrument were able to. And this also applied to choral music at any school in the state, I believe, public school. Elementary programs fed into middle school and high school programs. And that's where we could be in the band. And uh, so please keep art and music. Good evening. As far as I, I am concerned, this is the year of equity. Can we truly find equality in our district? Let's just simply recall LCOP survey. Are you aware that this important survey is a very difficult to understand to staff and parents? How much equity can we find in this way of ga gathering data? This is pure inequity. Have you, dear members of the board, attentive to read the LCOP survey. I have several questions. How does PBUSD make the decision to change assignments of the visual art teachers? Does PBUSD consult parents to decide how to implement music and release classes and reassigning visual art teachers to teach less time at their size? Do you family, do our families know PBUSD future plans to have general education teachers teach visual art what was the decision of having Save the Music Teachers displace visual art teachers voted by the board? Are you aware that Amesti Elementary received an incredible, generous gift from Leroy Neiman and Good Tidings Foundation? At Am an Amesti visual art studio was made with these funds, and it was promised that visual art classes will be maintained full time in, ve in a very special and unique studio. But with this direction that this district is going, this promise could be broken. PBUSD wants general education teachers to teach visual art without the proper training and degree. PBUSD did not notify visual art teachers of their plans ahead of time. Instead, notify us before vacations, the time we had to rest after a challenging year where we were having to give up our prep time to help our institution to deal with not having enough teachers to cover absences. 
the P that fact that PBOT did not give us time to explain what was planned by the district was unethical. We are people, people who have been giving our hearts, soul to teach our students. Please reconsider the, the decision of resigning visual art teachers and split Thank the you. time between two schools. A decision will that make time. negative impact in our students, family, and your, your time school. is up. That is two minutes. Thank you. I, I just would like to request, we have several speakers to this, so I would like to request that everybody please heed to your two minutes so we can hear everyone who has showed up to speak on this topic this evening. Thank you. Andriana, no last name, are you here? No? Okay, I'll call the next three. Ana Madera, Lisa Lopez Vai, and Maria Teresa Ame Amezquita. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Ana Madera. I'm a mom of a six-year-old um, son, Aramesti, and I'm here tonight to request a hearing and advocate on the opinion that we have on disagreement of splitting Ms. Lucia um, between two schools. We want to keep Ms. Lucia at Aramesti at full time, um, taking consideration that it's very important for my son education to keep Ms. Lucia full time. Uh, she's not only providing visual arts, but she's also providing um, Spanish. Um, she's teaching um, these classes in, in Spanish uh, for bilingual students. So that's very important for my son as he's, um, um, he's learning English. He's mainly Spanish speaking for the moment. Um, so she's a great asset to um, our, our school. And I feel very proud to have my son attend Adamesti. Um, for two years now, knowing that our school has been honored um, by having a studio donated for visual arts and, and Ms. Lucia is doing a great job at Amesti. So please con um, continue to have those two hours of arts per week at Amesti for my son with Ms. Lucia. Thank you. Buenas noches, mi nombre es María Teresa Mezquita. Uh, good night, my name is Maria Teresa Amesquita. Soy madre de familia de la escuela Amesqui. Uh, yo estoy abogando por mi Lucía, por mantener su clase completa como la tenía uh, para mí. Um, I am a parent at Amesti. I am here to um, support Miss Lucía, uh, for, for her to keep her class the way it was. Uh, Es importante todas las artes. Uh, yo no le, no le hago menos a la música, pero con mis hijos, como ejemplo, ellos son más introvertidos. Para ellos el arte visual, dibujar, es, es más una forma más fácil para ellos expresarse. Entonces, para mí es muy importante que siga como está. I'm not saying that any kind of art is less than any other, so I'm not saying music is less important than visual arts, but for my kids, um, they're not, they're shy, so for them, um, drawing is a better way to express themselves, themselves, and that's why I'm supporting this. Um, my son the other day, um, I am very proud to have Miss Lucia in the class because the other day my 18-year-old son came to the room and saw my daughter's art on the wall. And he was asking who um, had drawn that. And I told him that it was my six-year-old daughter. And he looked at it and he's like, oh, this is not something that a six-year-old can do. 
And my daughter stated that I, I can do that because I have Miss Lucia. Yeah. Sí, dígalo también, está bien, yo la apoyo. Dígalo en inglés. En el City Hall. Y mi mayor Muy bien. Lisa López. Buenas noches. Good night. Uh, <laughs> mi nombre es Lisa López y estoy aquí para apoyar a Miss Lucía. Me gustaría que siguiera como hasta hoy. Ha sido de gran apoyo para mi hija. Um, <laughs> Good night, everyone. I am. I'm here to support Ms. Lucia. I would like to keep her the way she's been um, helping. She's been a great support for my daughter. Uh, ella expresa con arte lo que siente, lo que quiere. Uh, she expresses her feelings and what she wants uh, through the art. Um, mi refri está lleno de arte. My fridge is full of art. El Día de las Madres también. On Mother's Day too. Y ha sido un orgullo mi hija en arte porque también han escogido su arte para exhibirlo. And I am my I'm very proud of my daughter because her art has also been chosen to be exposed. Ella está muy contenta de tener a la maestra Lucía como su maestra de arte y ella quiere que siga con ella de tiempo completo. She's very happy to have Miss Lucia as her teacher and she wants her to continue being her teacher full time. Espero que lo tomen en cuenta y que también piensen en nuestros hijos que les gusta expresar dibujando. I, I hope you consider that or you take that into consideration and you consider our children who uh, express themselves through uh, drawing. Thank you. Okay, for the next three, I have Rosa Gallardo, Valeria Hernandez Gallardo, and Aida Alvarado. Hi, my name. Hi, my name is Valeria. I'm here to. I'm in Ms. Lucia's art class, and in the Mesti, I came here to say that you shouldn't put. Ms. Lucia and two schools because it's too much for her and it's not I want to it's not um, fair to us to the students I think the, I think I want her to stay. I want her to stay in the Mesti. I think the best solution is to have a teacher in each school of art. I As a Mesti, we need her. We love her. Thank you. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Rosa. Good night, my name is Rosa. Y soy madre de familia, soy la mamá de Valeria. I am a parent, I'm Valeria's mother. Y vengo a apoyar a la maestra Lucía porque no es justo de que este, a ella la pongan en dos escuelas porque ella es una maestra que se dedica mucho a su trabajo. Um, I am here to support teacher Lucia because it's not fair for her to be split into two schools because she's very de dedicated to her job. Y mi hija también me dice lo mismo que ella se expresa en el arte porque dice que allí su mente vuela para hacer dibujar o para hacer arte. And my daughter also expresses that she can express herself through art. She tells me that her mind flies away when she's drawing. 
y ojalá que lo tomen en cuenta la opinión de los padres. Gracias. And I hope you take into consideration the parents' opinion. Thank you. I may be saying the first name wrong, but it's last name Avarado. Are you here? No? Aida? No? Okay. The next three I have are Judy Stable, Veronica Martinez Silva, I think. I'm sorry if I'm saying your names wrong. And Francisco um, Hasco. Hasco? Good evening. I'm Judy Stabile, a volunteer with Arts Now Para Valley, an arts education adv advocacy group that is part of Create California. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to work with three VAPA coordinators within PVUSD and have seen tremendous growth. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, and thank you to all the VAPA coordinators. Um, however, when it comes to equity, I do see opportunities for improvement. Equity for students means that all students have access to all art forms. This is not currently the case. We come the closest with the music program, congratulations. But visual arts right now serves grades one, to, uh, one through three at 14 out of 16 schools. This means that between schools, students do not have the same opportunities to excel at the state mandated standards as other students. Equity also means allowing equal access to art programming for English language learners, which is not always the case. Also, within the district, all co curricular area coordinator positions were elevated to the director's status, with the exception of the VAPA coordinator. The stated reason was that curriculum did not reach all students within the district, though the state mandates that. The VAPA coordinator should not be penalized for the lack of funding and support to provide equitable access within the district. With the addition of Prop 28 funding, I urge the board to support equity in all areas of the VAPA program, including dance and theater, as well as an updated community-driven arts plan. I urge the board to consider elevating the VAPA coordinator position to the director level with um, the approval of the next budget, and I encourage the board to support the students, teachers, and district staff, both through your actions and through your attendance at student performances and exhibits. Thank you. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Verónica Martínez. Antes que todo, estoy muy nerviosa. Es la primera vez que estoy en un micrófono. Hi, my name is Veronica Martinez. First of all, I'm very nervous. This is my first time in front of a microphone. Todo lo hago por mi hija, porque ella tiene un gran talento. Eh, estoy por ella aquí. Uh, les pido de favor, si, si están sus manos, por favor, no quiten las clases. Bueno, no las van a quitar, pero déjenlas como están, porque es una forma. Ahorita los niños se la pasan en el celular todo el tiempo. Um, I am doing this for my daughter. I'm, I'm here because of her. Um, I'm asking if it's in your hands, please don't take those classes away. I know you're not taking them away, but I'm asking if it's uh, within your power, please leave them the way they are. Because nowadays kids are on their cell phones a lot of the time, and this is a good program for my daughter. She is a grand, um, she's a big artist. Entonces ella ahora en las vacaciones pasa mucho tiempo dibujando, y es algo bonito. Su padre está llena de dibujos de ella. Mi, mi cuarto lo tiene igual. Les pido, por favor, apoyen a la maestra Lucía, apoyen a todos los niños que tienen ese gran talento, porque yo creo que mi hija puede llegar a ser algo grande, un Picasso. Gracias. So, my daughter, um, now through the summer, she has her walls are covered with her art. My room, the same way, is covered with her art. I am asking if you can please support all the kids with this art. I feel that my daughter can do big things. You know, hopefully a Picasso. Thank you. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Francisco. Uh, good night. My name is Francisco. Este, vengo a apoyar a la maestra Lucía, al igual a, a mi hija. I'm Estoy here to... En Amnesty. I am here to support uh, teacher Lucía. Uh, my daughter studies at Amnesty. Mi hija se siente feliz cuando tiene la clase de arte. Es su forma de expresarse. 
My daughter um, is very happy when she has her art class. It's her way of expressing herself. Siempre que llega a casa me, me enseña sus dibujos y, y cómo ella se siente al momento de enseñarme sus dibujos. Every time she comes home, she shares her uh, drawings with me and how she feels when she's sharing those drawings with me. So, <coughs> para mí es un orgullo que ella exprese sus sentimientos a través del dibujo y que tenga esa emoción por dibujar. I am very proud that she can express her emotions through um, her drawings and that she has uh, a way of expressing herself through drawing. So, no más quiero um, decir que mantengan la clase como la tiene. I'm just here to say to please keep the class as she has it now. Gracias. Thank you. And our last speaker on this item is Graciela Vega. To you, my name is Graciela Vega. I come to you as a community member, as a mother, and um, as a child who grew up drawing in the schools. You know, drawing has um, has been a wonderful way of note taking and creating beauty. Um, I'm concerned about the unintended consequences of making policy changes. And I see that we're advocating for the arts because I only see music there, which is only one branch of the arts. We have dance, we have opera, theater, spoken word, puppetry, improv and comedy because we all need to laugh after all these four years that have been going on one crisis after the other you know times have been tough from the policy making decision end from the community end from our families we've had so much loss and art is a way of expressing that 45 minutes of doing art heals the mind you know even doodling even coloring, you know, why is coloring for adults so popular? Because it heals us from all our stress, even for the children. I'm concerned about the unintended consequences. And I see that we're considering the music. And I know that there are musicians in the room. But I'm concerned about the divided time. And I would love for us to keep art and have more art in the room because we have Judy Stabile who is the Paro Valley Arts person here. She just got a big building on Main Street. The city moved to have more art. So hopefully we can too. We can grow it. Thank you so much. Thank you to all that um, showed up this evening to speak to this item. Um, my only regret now in looking at this was that we didn't get this moved up on the agenda sooner, noting that we had so many of our youth in the room tonight. But here we are. Um, let's bring this back to the board. Discussion, questions, comments? Trustee Dodge, Jr. Uh, thank you for everybody that stayed and spoke tonight. Um, just, just a quick question. I'm not sure. Um, does E Hall have a music teacher? And if so, what's what's the person's name? Do you do you know his name at E A Hall? Okay. Are, are they still there for next year, or was that a position that's being considered? So just just to be clear, so we continue to increase at the secondary level. Um, elementary, it's actually not that we're decreasing, we're actually trying to do what Judy said, which is provide more equitable, because mm -hmm. at this point, we don't have um, art in all of our elementary schools. What this transition would do would be, would allow us to put art at every elementary school except for one. Okay. Um, so middle and high school is not um, being affected at all, and we continue to grow that program. Yeah. 
And just to make a comment, I'd just like to say thank you to the Minnie White teachers. I get your emails. Um, thank you for always advocating. I, I try to answer my emails back as much as I can. And I just also wanted to say thank you to the teachers at Minnie White for making it a special place. So thank you. Trustee Bolano Scal. Yes, thank you everybody for coming, for, for staying so long, and for your, your powerful testimony. It's, um, it's wonderful to hear about our art teachers, our visual art teachers, um, who are, we just have an amazing group of visual art teachers, and we see the results all over the town, all over the district. Obviously, we have a very strong visual art culture in Watsonville and the Pajaro Valley, so it's, it's something that um, is important to me that I want to build. Um, and the and I've been briefed a little bit on the release schedule, and it's very complicated, uh, the way it works. There's no question about it. Um, and naturally, I'm happy that music is, is coming, but I don't want it to come at the expense of art, uh, especially when we have established programs like Miss Lucia at, uh, at Amesti. You can look her up. There's an amazing mural that's in the Santa Cruz Sentinel that she led over COVID that'll blow you away where kids are making clay, and, and it's just a beautiful thing. At MSD. And also, my understanding is that she's doing after school for fourth and fifth grade because one of our speakers said that hardly at any of our, we don't currently offer art for fourth and fifth grades. And when we think about sequential education, like, as like, what's the goal? We want to have music for K through five, but why wouldn't we want to have art someday for K through five as well? And so it makes, it doesn't make sense to me to re, not rehire teachers because I understand that Ann Soldo is losing its teacher, and then the idea is, well, Let's have Moose Lucia cover two schools, which is a really tall task and would decline the cert level of art service, obviously, at a MESTI, as we're hearing tonight. So it would be my preference that we rehire the art te elementary art teachers that we are losing, which I understand also at Rio del Mar, Landmark Elementary, uh, Radcliffe, because that person's going to PV High, is what I'm told, and Ann Soldo. And so that we maintain our existing level of art teachers going for next year and not reduce them. As, and, and yes, it's been, we're going to have Prop 28 money coming. Yes, we needed to figure out how to use that correctly and be responsible. I agree with that. But we do have some money coming. That's a great thing as well. So that's, that's what I would think is, is a model that we want to strive towards. Um, uh, we can't get everything we want next year. But I do, I do, I cannot, I do not want to see a reduction in visual arts teachers going into the next year. So I'd like to make a motion along those lines um, where we would maintain uh, the same level of art teachers and the same level of assignments um, for next year that we started at, at the beginning of last year. So prior to just the second, we would, I would like us to consider the funding of that because that means that we would need to take away from something else in order to be able to do so. So there is, a, if we are not willing to wait, I understand it's really challenging to wait, but if we are not willing to wait to effectively and accurately use Prop 28, which is what we should do to be fiscally responsible, then you must find it out of general fund. Because if it winds up being that you cannot supplant, which means you cannot pay for current costs, then that means that if you add it tonight, then you will not be able to use Prop 28. I think my record stands for itself that I believe in the arts, not just music, but I believe in the arts. Um, we have put millions every year of LCAP funding into the arts because I believe in them. But, and I understand, and I'm not going to get into personnel issues, but I do want to publicly state, I agree that Mrs. Lucia is awesome. And I've told her that. I believe that she is awesome. But they are overstaffed at a Amesti, and it is not fair to the other sites to not then have equal allocation. And frankly, we cannot fiscally do that without Prop 28. And so I understand that it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge because believe me, I wanted this to go away too. So we wanted Prop to know where, what we could do with Prop 28 months ago, we tried. We haven't been able to get it from the state. And um, so 
if you do the the second and the motion then I need you to be aware that then you will be cutting from other positions. And um, can, can I respond? Well, well, certainly we need to find the money. And if our board, and I hope my board wants to do that, and we will need to find the money, no question about that. Um, and it's a perfect time to have this discussion in some ways because we're going through the budget and we, we want to express that we want to invest in a major way in arts in our district. Uh, that it's worth investing in. And uh, I just think it's unfair to go with these reassignments and not rehire our teachers and really spread people thin to a way that we burn them out and it's just not going to be a level of quality that our kids, students are getting now. So, But I, you make a fair point, Dr. Rodriguez. we got to find the money. I'm, uh, I'm talking about rehiring the positions at Rio del Mar, Radcliffe, Landmark, and Solo for t teachers. I think... I feel pretty confident we can do it, so I hope my board will, board will support this. Uh, I trustee De Serpe, I think, wants to make a comment. Dr. Rodriguez, did you want to speak before? So it would then mean that we would need to look at all the other elementary schools, such as McQuitty. So for example, McQuitty um, was going to get the 50-50, and when I was there, they were like, when are we going to get back? our part, uh, part uh, when are we going to get back an art teacher? And the answer was you were going to get the point five. So it isn't, it is a misnomer to say that we're talking about four positions. Um, four positions is half a million dollars. So I just wanted to note that. But it's not actually four positions. If you want to equitably provide services to students, it is not just four positions. Um, you're talking more eight positions, which is based close to a million dollars. Um, and so if you would like to engage in the discussion, I think that my suggestion is that you wait until the 17th because finding a million dollars is not as easy as you think. Just to clarify, I'm not moving for eight. I'm moving that we rehire Ansoldo, Landmark, Rio, and Radcliffe. That's my motion and maintain the assignments that we had at the beginning of last year. And before I call for a second, I know there are some other comments wanting to come from the board, so let's, if we could hear those. Uh, I'm gonna go with Trustee DeSerpa and then I'll bring it back down to Trustee Flores. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think, Adam, what you're proposing is a full-time art teacher at every single elementary school, correct? Because we don't have that now. Th we that have. would be a long-term goal. My motion says let's maintain the same, same level of staffing that we had at the beginning of last okay, year. Okay, but it sounds to me like at, Mint, at Amesti and Minty, potentially, we're leaving two full-time art teachers in place. So what I have to say to that is that I have elementary schools that I represent. Where's my full-time art teacher? That's not fair. It's not equitable. I included Rio Del Mar in my, in my motion, too. I don't think they've had a full-time art teacher, have they? They they had one at the beginning of this year. They lost, then they had a full-time sub, and then the person has been told. Okay, they're not but coming back. what I'm saying is that you can't have three okay. or four full-time art teachers at, at four schools and not the rest of the elementary schools across the district. It's not fair. Tr Trustee Deserpa and Trustee Bolano Scout, I believe um, our assistant superintendent of HR is um, trying to interject here and uh, provide yeah. some information on the topic. Sorry, I'll, we can. I'll double check. I got to look up in a state, but Landmark didn't have an art teacher this year. They just had music, so that would be an addition. I'll, I'll, I'll double check, <laughs> but and then Mar Vista doesn't have an art teacher. So if you're right. talking about one in your area, they they don't. Yeah, and Valencia does not have a full time art teacher either. They, they have two positions that make up a one point three. Two art teacher positions. They have a one point three worth of it, so they they have two people that are one point three over. Okay, that makes sense. Right, but my point is is that this is a huge expense. It's not just a million dollars. If we literally had a full-time art teacher at every single school, every single elementary school, what would that cost? In general, I, we won't hold you to it. $4.4 million. Okay, 4.4. So that's number one. Number two, what about the instructional minutes in the day and where would those fit in? So if we're having, like for example, Valencia, 
We have a science release teacher. We have art release in the morning. Where would we put the, I mean, where, where do we put the extra instructional minutes in? And what about like coding and science and PE and all the other things that are equally as important? You, you bring up a good point. There, there, there is within the instructional minutes of the day to get in the amount of re release time that we're providing if we go over, there isn't enough time to do that. So the people would be, even though we're paying for a 1.0, part of their day would not be serving students in the intention that they're there for. Okay. And then around Prop 28, I, I am a little confused. I thought we were already getting some Prop 28 money. Is that not true? It hasn't started rolling yet. Budget. So Prop 28 was approved. It starts in 23-24. The problem we're having and that everyone in the state is having is CDE will not clarify for us what can we spend those dollars on in terms of what is supplanting and what is not. So when we review it, we look at it and say if we have, let's say a site needs one release. Currently they have two release. So we're going to reduce one release to actually give them what they need. Can we use Prop 28 to bring back that other release? Or are they going to say no because in 22-23 you had two. So now you have to actually add a third, which we wouldn't be able to do because that would then mean we have to add a full one through general fund as well as a full one through Prop 28. Unfortunately, no site other than the high schools, none of our elementary schools are receiving enough Prop 28 funds to pay for an entire teacher. Not one single one of our sites. They receive around 70,000, 80,000. A full-time teacher ranges anywhere from 125,000 to upwards of around 140. So none of the sites actually will receive enough Prop 28 to pay for an entire teacher for their site. So what we would like to do is look at it and say, are we able to use some of that money where, and what the state actually has recommended is have two sites share a teacher. That's our recommendation. They actually have an FAQ on their site about it of that's how we recommend you afford staff because we understand that you can't actually afford staff with the dollars of Prop 28. The biggest challenge we're having and Colleen and I have been working with our auditors is how do you determine that we're doing above and beyond what we did last year when, as I've shown, we're declining in enrollment, which means we need less release time. Therefore, anything to Allison's point that we give above and beyond release is not actually release time for students. It's not going to be time in front of students. It may be time working on art projects for the school, but it won't necessarily be time saying I'm taking a student out of a class and teaching them art because there's just not enough minutes in the day. So it's complicated. Very much so. The other thing is when I went to the delegate assembly recently, the governor's budget had, for example, I think our, 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 the ramifications of the governor's revise was that we would potentially have to cut $23.5 million out of our budget, and that was like a maybe, right, out of our general fund budget. Are you referring to arts dollars or overall? I think overall. So I remember. So for us, um, I don't know the exact number for us, what well, we are reducing in both learning loss and arts and music, the one-time dollars. Um, but in terms of general fund, we'll be seeing the COLA. But the governor, again, from May revised, there's big, the big hits are really to arts and music and to... Um, so that's the block grant. Those are the block grants, correct. Right, Lovely. so we are losing in the block grant. Absolutely. The arts and music block grant. Yep. Okay probably be prepared to speak about that on Saturday more like what the actual dollar figures were were guesstimating will be yeah absolutely it was in the May revised presentation so I can pull that out and put okay, it in again that would be absolutely great. thank you trustee Flores well I appreciate you know everything we've heard tonight I dr. Rodriguez um, Balana Scal and Mr. but I you all hit on points that I totally agree with um, I have my kids are at WCSA. I have a musician. I have an artist. I, I have. I'm a half a degree in architecture. So I, art is very important to us and our family. And I believe every child needs to have that exposure. At the same time, I, I see where just where um, Trustee Deserpa is coming from. Where you know, if we're gonna have a full time visual arts teacher at one elementary, we should have that across. Now, I'm not saying we have the. You were saying like we can't do that. Now you're saying just the four, but that is something our district should thrive, should shoot for, just like we did for this with this music program. Um, I think definitely we should make a goal that that's something we should 
you know, a five-year plan just like we had here. We need, we should have a, vir a visual arts teacher in, you know, each of our elementary schools. Um, I, you know, like we saw in this, in our budget presentation, it's gonna come down to, you know, the funding and I feel like maybe Saturday would be a better opportunity for us to dive deeper into this and find those dollars, you know, before we just, say like, like I'm, I, I'm concerned that by allocating it now and then like what Dr. Rodriguez said if it comes back that we can't we're limited with those prop 20 um, sorry I can't think of the number right now to prop 28 um, funds we're gonna find ourselves in a in a pickle so that those are my con my concerns right now anything else Yeah, I'm in, I'm in agreement with uh, Trustee Flores. I mean, it, it, I've been here as a maintenance supervisor and dealt with budgets, and I'm pretty, not, I mean, not completely familiar, but somewhat apprised of the process. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that need to get done, but you have to take baby steps. And, you know, you don't want to, you know, like, like Dr. Rodriguez said, get stuck with something that we can't afford. I mean, it might be shiny and pretty up front, but you know, later on the payment's going to be a little tough. So, um, yeah, I think we we need to we need to take baby steps. We need to set some goals and make a plan to try to implement you know other schools later on down the road. Um, and it's true what Clint says is government's going to get tight. You know, budgets are going to get small. If you're paying attention to what's going on in the world, you're going to start seeing that. You know, we're, we're going to have some pretty hard discussions later on down the road, and uh, we need to be cognizant of that. And uh, so that's my two cents. Trustee Valenosco. Well, um, I mean, there's a couple of things I think it's fair to feel that we want to look in, into it more in the budget on Saturday. Obviously, our board requested that. I, I respect that. Um, I do, it is important to me that we want to set a goal, and obviously you want to feel financially that we can do it. I'm not saying we're going to do it overnight. I do feel it's unfair to a Mesty Elementary and Miss Lucia to reassign her because we're not going to rehire their art teachers. And so that's why in my first motion I said, Let's rehire those art teachers. We had, I mean, we had the money for them last year, and I get we're getting some music now, um, and we have great reserves. And twenty eight is coming. If, if that's not, if that motion feels too ambitious for tonight, then I'd be willing to amend my motion that we l narrow it to ensure that uh, the assignments are the same for the continuing art teachers going into next year as they were last year if that feels more palatable. I think, I'm sorry, I need elaboration on that. So you're, you're wanting to amend the motion that? That the, art the assignments for our visual art teachers in the elementary schools, the assignments, the schools they teach at, for those continuing into next year are the same as they were the past year. Without the proposed without the, change? Without the rehirings. Okay. Do I, I, and I do have questions and comments, by the way, but I just want to make sure I'm respecting all my colleagues and everybody's getting in. Did you have a, another comment? I'm sorry, before I make my comments just, and questions. You know, I, I was just listening to everybody speak, and uh, I also agree with what Trustee Flores. Um, I think this is probably better something to be talked about on Saturday, and so I, I that's where I stand. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, Trustee Acosta, it's me. I'm sorry, but no just to, the piece about Thanks. keeping assignments the same, it will cause us to not allow, some sites will then be under um, their FTE for release, and therefore would it, it cause us to have to hire more because of that. So I just wanted to. That, that was, you, you, that was gonna be one of my questions. Oh, okay. So you answered it, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, um, so. Dr. Rodriguez, could you um, maybe elaborate um, about this talk conversation about continuing this conversation maybe on Saturday or beyond Saturday 
we have the June 17th, the special study session on the budget, where there could definitely be a deeper dive there, I guess, to look where would we, and being very clear to what you said, that this would have to come from something else, right? It, it would have to come, we'd have to give something else for it. Um, and then, but should there be a decision or, or some direction with that, that could be implemented in the decision in the June 28th board meeting, approving the agenda? Or would this have to come back as an action item on June 28th, or would it be part of the budget approval on June 28th? Yeah, so, well, FTE is part of the budget, so, I mean, it could be included within there. I, I know it is challenging to be patient, but I yeah. really feel if we can be patient in learning to uh, knowing what we can use Prop 28 for, then we can actually have what people want. Um, and do w do we know when we're going to know the Prop 28? I I cannot I cannot say. I'm assuming that it will be before school starts. I'm assuming, but we have been pushing pretty hard to get clarity. I mean, we're, we we put somebody called me a fighter. Um, <laughs> I mean, so we've been like we haven't been resting on our laurels to try to find out the answer to this question. Um, so a lot of what is being requested is probably possible if we can figure out how to use Prop 28. And then you won't have to make the difficult decision of trying to figure out where to get the money that you're stating. But I, I don't feel I. I feel obligated to advocate for all school sites. And so if we're gonna do it, then we gotta do it right. It can't just be the ones that are being vocal at the time because that's how we used to do things versus really providing a common experience for our students. And I believe that's important. Right. And that, you answered that again, what was gonna be one of my questions was, and I wasn't gonna wanna put you on a, the spot with it, but when you thought we might know about Prop 28, so you've actually already answered that. So if, and I'm not sure how this would go at this point, because there is a motion, it hasn't been seconded yet, but I, based on comments that I've heard from Trustee Flores and Trustee Soto and Trustee Dodge Jr., I'm really, um, and I think even Trustee DeSerpa maybe said similarly, that having a bigger conversation about this on Saturday and deciding what we could do going forward with the budget conversation then and into the June 28th where we have to actually approve a budget is important. I, I have always been believed in being fiscally sound as long as I have been on this board. So I, I can't sidestep that when I have to take based off of your advice of what you're giving as the expert of this, that this is sort of just what it has to be now. And as much as mm -hmm. Many of us may not like it, um, and that's difficult. I, we have a duty, right? And I, that's part of what I called for about the special study session and the, on the, the budget and the transparency and to, and to do that because how we've been called out as the board, the administration, that we're not being diligent, we're not being transparent, and to have that conversation and say, here it is. Because we have that responsibility as stewards. We are, we're the seven who sit here that are elected are elected to be stewards of that, right? And the same as the administration has a responsibility of stewardship. So I'm going to have to support the, the, this position that I've heard um, Trustee Flores has commented and Trustee Dodge Jr. and Soto and I believe Trustee DeSerpis and comments to that um, to just put it to then and see what we could do maybe by then, by the June 28th. And then if not, we'll have to work with our cabinet and whoever our interim superintendent will be that's going to be another conversation later not jumping ahead to help us figure all that out for next school year that's where I'm in support but can, you can, can I amend my can I amend my motion given what I'm hearing can I meant and I just want to know I'm excited to hear about the millions we have the tens of millions we have in reserves and I know that's going to come out on Saturday as well so I feel confident we can do this but I'm hearing my colleagues speak I guess I'm the only one and I'm obviously fighting for my, 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 my students and my parents and my constituency, because I think that's my job as a board member. And I want to say Minty was going to get treated this way, but then they got told 
yesterday or two days ago that they weren't, and I just feel that's unfair. But I hear what you're saying. And I'm going to amend my motion and ask that we continue this agenda item on June 28th with the understanding that we're going to get some more information on Saturday. That, that's that my appropriate to what you think could be done? Um, I would love a second. So, but, and I think you said you wanted, it sounds like conversation wants to be had on Saturday about this. Yeah. That could be done. Okay. Did you, I'm sorry, has anyone else Yes, let's not. Okay, so I have first now. Can I, it's so open. can I clarify what the first is? I'm sorry. Okay. To move the continue the agenda item to June 28th with the understanding we'll have more information about this topic on Saturday and, and have more time to deliberate. Okay, and that seems okay. Yeah. But is that going to hinder any hiring that we might need to do between now and then in terms of at least the halftime positions? No. Okay, great. I'll second that. Um, and I'm sorry, and I think Trustee Flores had a comment? Or? Yeah, mostly just a comment. I was going to actually second, but um, I, I was happy to hear you say that hopefully we get some good news about the Proposition 28 and we can do exactly what um, Trustee Bolano Scal is asking for. Um, uh, yeah, and I think that would be great. And I would totally support, you know, if we're going to have to start somewhere with every elementary school having a visual arts teacher, then I would support starting with teacher Lucia, you know, because like I, I get we need an album, but it, just like with Save the Music, it had started at two and then it grew from there. So but it's not overnight, we're not going to say every elementary school has one, but if we're going to start somewhere, we could start with a bestie. And so if we have a, a plan and, you know, the funding and all of that, so I would definitely support that. Um, and so, yeah, Tashi Deserpo already seconded. But Okay, so I have a first and second. Trustee DeSerpa, did you have another comment? Oh, you good? No, that was great. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, we have a first, we have a second. I will now call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? The vote carries 6-0-1. Um, I'd like to bring out a point of order. It is coming up on 10-22 p.m. And we have to go back into closed session, and we are only on item 10.3 out of a total of, uh, we have 11 plus consent, plus we do need to return to uh, closed session. I'll entertain a motion to extend the meeting. <laughs> I will move to extend our meeting to midnight. Is that long enough? Okay, I'll second. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I have a first and a second to extend the meeting till midnight. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that vote carries six zero one. Thank you. And now we will be moving on to item ten point three. Um, this item will be presented by our assistant superintendent of uh, human resources, Ms. Allison Niazawa, and this is to prove the M. Memorandum of Understanding between PBUSD and PVFT for release teachers for the Save the Music expansion. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Vice President Acosta, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So this MOU, as Roddy spoke about earlier, is um, to address the fact that if our art teachers or any of our release teachers need to be split between two sites um, for the next year, that we're going to offer them some extra time in order to do so. We want to make sure that they're able to prepare and plan for their new site and location and have a workspace or, and a classroom that's ready to receive our students. So similarly to what we did with Pajaro Middle needing to relocate to, Lan to Lakeview, um, we increased the number of days. Um, and then we also put in some clarifying language around grade spans, as Dr. Rodriguez spoke to earlier, um, with regards to our arts and our, and our sciences. So I respectfully request that you please approve this MOU tonight. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, in that case, I will bring it back to the board. Do we have any questions, comments, or discussion from the board? This is awesome, a dream come true. I'll move to approve. Perfect. A second. I have a first, I have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries 6-0-1. Moving on to item 10.4, this um, 
action item will be presented again by our Assistant Superintendent of HR, Ms. Alison Niazawa, to approve the Memorandum of Understanding between PVUSD and CSEA Chapter 132, the transportation stipend for Summer School 2022-2023. Yes, thank you again, Vice President uh, Acosta and Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. We have an MOU for you tonight that we did in collaboration with CSCA. Um, we were having a little bit of a challenge getting bus drivers to do our summer school routes. So this stipend was put in place to incentivize our drivers and our um, other transportation employees who also hold a driver's license to drive buses to take the routes. Um, so this has definitely helped aid in that. and. Um, staff our, our routes for summer school. So I respectfully request that you approve this MOU as well. Do we have any public speakers to this? We do not. In that case, I will bring it back to the board. Any questions or comments from the board? Where do I sign up? <laughs> uh, HR, I'll, finger, I'll take you over there right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, I have a first. I do have a comment, but I'll call for a second unless anybody else has a comment. Oh, okay. Um, oh, my comment was, I just, or, or, sorry, not a comment, it was more of a question. Mm -hmm. um, so they, these are, because we have had the contracts the, with Michaels and such in the past, but these are our employees? These are our employees, so it was in, to incentivize them to sign up for summer school. So it's extra work for our employees only. So yeah, this is only for not, current not bus drivers. Not nope, or any nope, other nope, subcarriers. Nope, PVUSD. Yep. Okay, I, I mean, I assume by the title of it, but I'm just making sure nope, 100% good clarification. for my clarification. So I would like to be the one to second this, if I may. Um, so we have a first, a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the vote, uh, motion carries 6-0-1. Um, moving on to item 10.5, the word language instructional materials adoption for grades 6 through 12. This report will be presented by our Executive Director for Teaching and Learning, Ms. Peggy Pugh. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Vice President Acosta, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I am here to present uh, the work of our world language teachers um, who this year um, reviewed and then piloted world language curriculum in Spanish, Spanish for Spanish speakers, and en français. The timeline is as follows. They uh, reviewed materials. We talked about the plan. They reviewed the um, paper and digital screening for all of the three different curricula. Um, they eventually selected the curricula to pilot, and then they piloted in the second semester. Um, and then eventually got together and uh, made their decision. We evaluated on just a, a paper screen of three different um, CDE approved curricula um, from Carnegie Learning, Vista Higher Learning, and Colette World Languages. Teachers from Alianza, Aptos High, PV High, Watsonville High all participated in that process and um, reviewed the materials um, together. Um, we used a variety of tools um, that we uh, got from the CDE World Language Adoption Toolkit. And the process, um, they ended up choosing two of those three. They decided on two of those to actually pilot. So there's the process of reviewing first on paper, and then they chose two. Um, for Spanish, there was an Aptos High teacher and a Watsonville High teacher who chose to pilot. For Spanish for Spanish speakers, we had two teachers from Alianza and two teachers from PV High. And then for French, we had one teacher from Aptos High and one teacher from Watsonville High. Each of those two curricula went through the same multi-week process. There was training first with the publisher, time for planning with their colleagues, regular check-ins with me, and then virtual drop-in and email access to the publishers and the representatives from those um, publishers. And then eventually we landed at the final decision-making process after the evaluation periods for both of those curricula. Um, and we used, again, the toolkit provided by the California Department of Education. And based on their analysis, the group unanimously chose to recommend Vista Higher Learning curriculum for all three areas, Spanish, Spanish for Spanish speakers, and French. The strengths that our teachers noted were the celebration of the rich cultures of Spanish and French speaking cultures throughout the world. Um, and they really valued that a lot. Um, support for differentiation and scaffolding and emphasis specifically on student engagement and a variety of tools um, for them to utilize to practice speaking and listening. 
um, and then also just a really strong technology integration. So the teachers uh, unanimously recommended, as I mentioned, that the PDUSD School Board approve VISTA Higher Learning Curriculum for all three of those content areas um, to be our adoptive materials starting this August. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. Any questions or comments from the board? Oh, I got both hands. Uh, Trustee Dodge, Jr. Thank you. Uh, so it says this program's gonna cost $792,000 mm -hmm. based on a lottery. Is that what it says? Budget source is a lottery. Oh, lottery funds, right? Lottery funds, yeah. <clears throat> oh, is that something already budgeted or is that something we're applying to? Um, so those are funds that we receive from the California lottery, oh, okay. but we use them for curriculum. Okay. Yeah. You know, you hear the lottery <laughs> gives money, but you know. But, yeah, so but. that is the money that we okay. receive from, All right. the, from I guess the California there you go. State Lottery. Yes. Lottery winning. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just ask a point of clarification? That's restricted, correct? Does that go into restricted funds, not the general fund? So there's a, a certain areas that we can support, and curriculum is one of them. Right, right, but it is restricted. Those funds are restricted funds. To are they, they're can? restricted. Yep. That's right. But I yes, and, to and Clint check. presented so that I earlier. There is a space in there that yeah. were for school curriculum. Yeah. That was just my elaborating question on that. Trustee DeSerpa. Oh, wonderful. Oh, anyone else? Okay, motion to approve. Thank you for the motion. Um, can I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Trustee Soto. So I have a first, I have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries 601. Thank you. Gracias y merci. <laughs> um, all right, moving on to item 10.6 updating existing policy titles using the new gamut system. This report will be presented by our very own Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, Superintendent of Schools. Yeah, thank you so much. So we use the GAMET system. So GAMET is a system that's through CSBA in which they provide us um, updates to all of our board policies. So they have a new process that's called GAMET Policy Plus. In order for us to have automatic upgrades to our board docs, meaning that they tell us when we are out of compliance, we have to have their exact titles. And so what you'll see is, is the policy number will not shift, but what we are going to have to do is change the naming. So let's go with the second one. Our current title is social media use. Instead of that title, so the policy number will stay the same, we are required to have a new title that is called district sponsored social media so that when legislation makes changes, they will flag for us when a policy is out of compliance. If we don't change the titles, they won't be able to do that flagging for us. It's no cost for us. Over 600 districts use it, because most um, school districts use CSBA as supports. And so you'll see what we're requesting. Again, the content, there is no change at all to any of the content. Um, but you can see that there is slight changes, just like another one. It, ours is world foreign language instruction, and it needs to be changed to world language instruction. And so in general, there are small changes. Um, but we're requesting that the board um, allow us to make those changes to the title so we can effectively use GAMET Policy Plus. Perfect, thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. I do have a question. Uh -huh. Does somebody else first? Did you, Trustee Soto, have a question first? Yes. Um, so are these, the, are these the only changes? Like about, it, how many are there, would you say it is um, roughly? I haven't count. It's I can count them. Really oh quick. no, no. But yes, these are the only changes that we're requesting. They are all inclusive. It looks like about 30, 39. Oh, there you go. Like <laughs> it probably so, was in my. Okay. And does this have to do with? Uh, just it was just a cu curiosity question. When mm -hmm. I go in and log into the board docs, how it says about the update? Does this have to do with that update? They can't do those updates until we do this. Okay. Gotcha. Was just wondering what that flag Yeah, so it has caused us quite significant issues, which is why we're doing this cleanup. Okay. Thank you for the elaboration. If there's no other comments or questions, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. 
I have a first. Can I'll I second. Have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries a uh, six zero one. Moving on to item ten point seven. Um, delete obsolete policy titles using new gamut system and this will again be uh, presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yes, thank you so much. So equally, so we've been working, well, Eva has been working, so I won't, I don't have a toad in my pocket. Um, Eva has been working with Gamut in order to be able to clean up. These are all um, ones which were deleted by CSBA. So these were removed and you can see and note the month and year in which they were deleted. So many of these have been deleted for several years. So, um, you know, December 14th, um, March 11th of, you know, March 2011. Um, and so these are the ones that we are um, requesting that be deleted. So again, part of the cleanup, um, for example, there is no child left behind anymore. And so in, on May 2016, it was officially deleted, but we have not deleted it. And so because of that, we're asking um, to assist with the cleanup and allow us to delete these obsolete policies. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Do we have any uh, public speakers to this? We do not. Seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. Any questions, comments, discussion from the board? Motion to approve. I have second. a motion. I have a second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Vote carry 601. Sorry. You're all going faster than I can keep up. <laughs> okay. And we um, removed on the approval of the agenda item 10.8. So we will be moving forward to item 10.9 um, The to approve and this, see if I, you could correct me, Dr. Rodriguez. Segamura? Vinny uh, Architects Agreement for the Pajaro Middle School Flood Restoration Project number 2023062. And this report will be presented by our Director of Maintenance and Operations and Facilities, Herlindo Fernandez. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, President, Vice President Acosta, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, board members, cabinet. My name is Herlindo Fernandez, and I'm the Director of Maintenance and Operations. And I'm here to ask for the approval of this um, to go into agreement with Sigamora Fini Architects out of San Jose, California for the Pajaro Middle School Flood Restoration Project. This project is estimated at $7 million for their compensation for the work. I'm asking for the approval of $840,000 to continue the project with Sigamora Architects out of San Jose so they could provide a full biddable set so we could go out to bid to restore Pajaro School. Do we have any public speakers to this action item? We do not. Okay. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Any questions, comments, discussion? Trustee Soto? Question, comment. So just to initiate this project, this is seven million for the architect alone. Or no. this or is this the school? No. 840 but, but the project is seven million it's the estimated scope? right now it's estimated at right seven million now. Dollars, okay. yes. yeah so based on our walk yeah this yeah. is going to get get fun because they're going to start opening things up and finding things out so okay so the architectural fee is 840 840 correct all right all right we'll see how this turns out down the road yeah good luck thank you i have a quick question does this include any improvements to the site to help flood mitigation or just site improvements that will help it be a better school, cleaner school, or is it just reconstruction? Reconstruction to what it was at this time. And that's why we have an architect on board. So if any DSA upgrades need to be happened, we're going to do it. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. That. Okay. Thank so you. just to speak to that real quick, Trustee De Serpa, um, all of these dollars that we're spending on Pajaro Middle, we will be applying for FEMA to re reimburse us for all of these dollars. FEMA does allow a small amount to be used to improve over what we had, especially if it's coming up to code, things like that. Those will be allowed, but they do have very strict guidelines on what we can do with the dollars that they'll reimburse. So we'll be working closely with the contractor to ensure that we're working with FEMA and 
not going above and beyond their scope because again, the $7 million we will be asking to be reimbursed by FEMA, which will most likely get about 90% reimbursed. That's great. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion. I think, Trustee Flores, did you have a question or a comment? Oh, no, I, I was just gonna, you know, you answered it pretty much, but I was gonna see like why an architect is necessary if it were just replacing like for like, but you, you answered that for me. Yeah. Okay, I have a first. Can I have a second? I'll second. I have a first, I have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries, Six zero one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item 10.10. .10. This is to add a discussion item on the June 17th, 2023 special board study session regarding the interim superintendent and permanent superintendent selection process. This report will be presented um, once again by our very own Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, superintendent of schools. Yeah, thank you so much. So as we've been discussing um, earlier this evening, we do have our special board study session on Saturday. Originally, it was slated just to be for budget. And so um, just due to recent events, um, then we're asking to add an additional discussion item as the first item before the board study session so that um, community can hear about the process and also board can engage in discussion and direction for um, staff. So request that um, we add this action item to our special board study session. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for any discussion. Second. Can I ask a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> she extends the meeting to midnight, but she wants to get out of here. Um, so I, I did my just quick question was, um, because that meeting is, a, I think when it was approved, it was approved to be like 10 to three. Mm -hmm. So is that, do you need any structure change in the time? Or is the 10 to 3 time is going to I, I think we'll be fine with okay. the 10 to 3. It was just I'm, I'm hope. I mean, I, um, I, mean, I guess the question five, is are five we hours of um, a budget is, is pretty challenging, so I think you'll be okay. Right. Um, <laughs> but if it did go over 3, is that allowed? You could extend. It could. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Okay, so I have a first extend. and I have a second. Oh, so sorry. Just uh, throw something out the back of my head. So, so. Just to let the people know watching and the location is? Oh, um, it was selected at, at EA Hall. So it would be at the EA Hall um, cafeteria. 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. So see everybody there. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for the clarification on that. Okay, so did we vote? Oh. Okay. I, I have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye, sorry. <laughs> um, aye. That carries six zero one. Right. Um, and then item ten point eleven: schedule an additional regular board meeting for July twenty twenty three. This report will be presented by uh, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, Superintendent of Schools. Yeah, thank you very much. So part of the requirements when you are approving either an interim superintendent or a regular superintendent contract is you must do it at a regular regularly scheduled board meeting. It can't be a special board meeting. So customarily, we only have one board meeting in July. And so this would be the official action and notice to the public that we are adding a regularly scheduled board meeting in July. Um, my recommendation is that it is the second week in July, the second um, Wednesday in July, as the first one would hit um, right at 4th of July. Um, we do have staff that will be out of town, um, and so um, that would be that would need to just know that it would be a skeletal crew. But um, I'm sure staff would make sure that they got got themselves there. And so we're asking for it if needed, um, because everything can be completed by the June 28th board meeting. You can always cancel this board meeting. Um, this just provides flexibility. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Do we have any um, public comments on this item? We do not. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for any questions, comments? Yes. Yes, Trustee Flores. Um, I was just going to say yes. I, I don't want to um, 
I don't want to, you know, do it so close to 4th of July, so I would suggest Ju uh, July 12th. And I would make a motion to add that to We have a motion for it to be on Wednesday, um, July 12th, and I imagine we would do a regular 6 and 7 o'clock because we may have to have closed session to cover some closed session items with that, and then the 7 o'clock start the regular. Perfect. Um, but I think we are looking that it's just going to be on that topic. It doesn't mean we'll be adding other stuff per se. That's true, but we can't limit it at this point because sure. it would technically be a regularly scheduled board meeting. Right. But, so um, agenda setting committee yeah. will make that determination. Okay. All right. Um, so we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 601. Um, next, we have the consent agenda. Can I have a, um, these are just our routine items that come before the board. Uh, do we have any public speakers, sorry, to consent agenda? We do not. See none. Are there any items that any of the board members wish to defer? If none, can I have a motion to approve the consent I'll, agenda? I'll move to as approve, oh. yeah, the consent agenda. Okay. I have a motion. No second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries 601. Um, there are no deferred consent, but we do need to reconvene to um, close session, and we will be back when we are done with that to report out of closed session. I'll call this meeting back to order. Um, so we um, are returning from closed session. We are under um, action item 14.1 to report out of closed session. So on with um, regards to closed session item 2.1, um, the expulsion under the closed session agenda item, the board voted in a 601 to approve the recommendation of the district administration of a full expulsion for one calendar year for student number 22-23-013. <clears throat> for closed session item 2.4, I move to approve the certificated personal report as presented by district administration on June 14, 2023 with 23 and 22 additional action items. I'll need a second. second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Oh, thank you. That motion carries 601. Um, with regards to closed session, item 2.5, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on June 14, 2023, with 21 and 6 additional action items. I'll need that second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Carries 601. Perfect. Thank you. On um, closed session items 2.6, the board voted 601 to approve a resignation agreement for one certificated employee, number 3357. For closed session item 2.8, the board voted 601 to approve a settlement agreement between PBUSD and classified employee, number 7852. And we do have a few announcements. Um, on behalf of our superintendent and district administration, we are pleased to announce Mr. Carlos Olivares' um, promotion to supervisor food and nutri nutrition services operations. Mr. Olivares has eight years of experience as a buyer in the district's food and nutrition services department. He managed the multitude of supply chain issues during the pandemic. He goes out of his way to help others connect with students and help his community. Mr. Olivares is always looking to learn and understand more about school food and nutrition services. His hobbies include photography, camping, biking, and exercising with his dog. 
He is a longtime resident of Watsonville and graduate of Watsonville High School. He takes great pride in being from Watsonville, his job, and his family. He looks forward to serving the district and continuing the good work on improving our food and nutrition programs for students. We are proud to welcome Mr. Olivares to his new role as Supervisor Food and Nutrition Services Operations. That's always great when we're promoting from within, right? Um, yes. Pajaro Valley Unified, announcement number two. Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Elizabeth de Vargas Almeida, Almeida? To the position of coordinator of early literacy, Elizabeth comes to PBUSD from the Gilroy Unified School District where she served as the academic coach for literacy. She has been heavily involved in all aspects of early literacy during her educational career, serving as a teacher in a, and reading TOSA and an early literacy intervention teacher. Elizabeth holds a bachelor's in psychology from Sonoma State as well as multiple subject credentials also from Sonoma St State. She obtained a master's in applied school leadership with an administrative credential from National University in Santa Clara and will finalize her educational doctorate this spring. We are excited to welcome this highly accomplished educator to PVSD. Welcome, Elizabeth. And our final and third announcement, uh, Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Maria Ferreira to the position of principal for Duncan Holbert. Maria is a highly experienced educator with a background in special education. She has served as special education teacher at different grade levels and as te new teacher project mentor. Most recently, she was awarded Teacher of the Year in Santa Cruz County. Maria holds a bachelor's degree in liberal studies and a education specialist credential from Fresno State, a level two education specialist credential from CSUMB, and a master's in education and administrative credential from University of Massachusetts Global. PBUSD is excited to have Maria join our team. Go see stars. Welcome, Maria. And the last thing um, is uh, to announce our upcoming board meetings. Bless you, as was mentioned um, earlier, numerous times this evening, our next board meeting is this Saturday, June 17th, um, at starting at 10 a.m. at EA Hall School in the cafeteria, and then our next regular board meeting will be Wednesday, June 28th. And with that, I will adjourn this meeting at 11.11. Okay, interesting time.